Good morning, good morning. We are calling to order today's Committee on Economic Development Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget Hearing. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Paul Vallone, and I am the Chair of Council's Committee on Economic Development. We are also joined today by Council Members Peter Koo, Adrian Adams, Carlos Menchaca, uh, and other members will be joining us. Today's capital budget and fiscal 28 investment projects report will be looked at and examined. Each one of the programs should support and be well integrated with one another to properly execute the city's capital projects as well as, as its infrastructure goals. We will examine to what extent this is occurring, where improvements need to be made, and the overall feasibility of NYC EDC's capital program. Additionally, we will look into the assistance NYC EDC provides to projects throughout the city on a discretionary basis to support economic growth and private investments. Projects may be firms or nonprofits, and it may take advisory, financial, or other forms. Most NYC EDC financial aid is administered by NYC IDA or Build NYC, with energy assistance co-administered by EDC and Con Edison. EDC is the city's primary agent for economic development, and their principal mandate is to encourage investment and to attract, retain, and create jobs in New York City. As such, this committee is interested in having a robust conversation about how EDC's budget, as laid out in this preliminary plan, connects to the larger job creation and economic development strategies of our city. The mayor has pledged to create 100,000 good paying jobs over the next 10 years. And we are interested to hear what role NYC EDC has been playing to achieve this goal. The 10-year capital strategy provides $3.7 billion in fiscal 2020 to 2029 for neighborhood revitalization, commercial development, infrastructure upgrade, industrial development, waterfront development, and port development. However, the strategy is very front-loaded. Unfortunately, this planning pattern is repeated in many other city agencies' 10-year strategies. The spending plan essentially cuts capital spending to almost nothing for the last six years of the plan. Hopefully this 10-year strategy does not reflect accurately how the funds will be used. This is in contrast to the five-year commitment plan. In fiscal 2017, the corporation committed $338 million, or 26.7% of its annual capital plan of $1.3 billion. In fiscal 2018, the corporation committed $320 million, or 53.8% of its annual capital plan. Through, though NYC EDC's actual commitments have not increased from fiscal 2017 to fiscal 2018, their five-year plan now more accurately projects what the agency expects to commit. We appreciate what the agency has done to improve its capital commitment plan and would like to see the same effort made for the 10-year strategy. Can NYC EDC then do this crosswalk for us between the agency's 10-year capital strategy and agency's budget lines in the capital budget commitment plan to show us how they fit and mesh together? NYC EDC has several funds in its capital plan that total over $1 billion for fiscal 2019 through 2028. These funds will be used in the future for various projects on city priorities. As the recipients of these funds are decided later, the City Council is not always aware of all these projects when the budget is adopted. We would like NYC EDC to provide us with a step-by-step -step description on how projects are selected and executed, and as well as how City Council is involved in this process. In addition to the 523 EDC projects, New York City EDC is also managing 1,067 capital projects for other agencies. The Council would like to learn more about how the agencies decide which projects are going to be worked on and how these are accounted for on an annual and daily basis. In addition to its capital projects, NYC EDC also has 488 active investment projects, 26 of which now are now in fiscal 2018, the period of the most investment projects report. Investment projects can revive advisory and financial assistance, including tax exemptions and other subsidies granted on discretionary basis. Financial incentives associated with the 26 newest projects for which information is available to total 15.9 million. Council is interested in hearing more about NYC EDC's recent investment projects, how they were chosen, how they relate to the city's economic development goals, and what new projects have begun since the last in projects report. NYC EDC has its own operating surplus and generates its own revenues by leasing or selling city land, 
operating services, and managing investments. These revenues are used to fund other NYC EDC activities, but some amount negotiated with the administration must be returned to the city's general fund. However, as always, the council is given little indication of how this amount is to be determined. To fulfill our oversight obligation, we want NYD EDC to explain how this amount is determined. What amount has been returned in the past several years, and how much do you anticipate returning to the city this fiscal year? It is essential that the budget we adopt this year is transparent, accountable, and reflective of the priorities and interests of the council and the people we represent. This hearing is a vital part of this process, and I expect that we will all be responsive to the questions and concerns of each of my fellow council members. I look forward to an active engagement with the administration over the next few months to ensure the fiscal 2020 adopted budget meets the goals the council has set out. I would like to thank uh, President James Patchett for being here today and testifying once again. I'd like to thank NYC EDC staff who have consistently been responsive to, to our amazing crew up here. We would not be able to analyze the city's budget at such a detailed level without your cooperation. So we thank you, and I want to personally thank the staff and everyone that's here, especially from the Finance Division, for the help in preparing this hearing. I felt I was like back in macro microeconomics in Fordham University going through the billions of dollars on this. And with that, I turn it over to you. We should have class outside today, James. I think it, was, yeah. it would have been nicer. <laughs> it's a lovely day. It's maybe spring is here. Um, good morning, Chair Vallone. Actually, before you start, yeah. let's just swear you. Oh, of course. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, please raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. You too, Kim. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Vallone and members of the Economic Development Committee. My name is James Batchett, and I am the President and CEO of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, also known as EDC. I am pleased to testi testify, you, testify before you to discuss funding in EDC's preliminary budget and provide updates on some of our projects. I am joined today by my, by my colleagues Kim Vacari, who is our Chief Financial Officer, and James Katz, our Chief of Staff. After my, my testimony, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. EDC is a self-sustaining nonprofit organization that drives and shapes New York's economic growth. We manage city resources to create a bridge between agencies, local communities, and private businesses in three key ways. By owning and managing over 66 million square feet of real estate, which we are constantly improving and upgrading to maximize economic impact. By building neighborhood infrastructure to ensure the communities have a good quality of life. And finally, by investing in growth industries that have the potential to create good paying jobs for all New Yorkers. Every day, EDC works on projects that make the city fairer today and stronger tomorrow. Today, when the city's unemployment rate is at 4%, a record low, and we are home to more than 4.5 million jobs, a record high, it is easy to believe that New York is safe from future economic blows. But as the head of the city's Economic Development Corporation, I have a responsibility to ensure that New York's residents and businesses are prepared for the next downturn. And that downturn could happen sooner than we would like. Last month, the Washington Post reported that most leading economists think the U.S. will enter a recession by 2021. Moreover, half of the group polled said a downturn could hit as early as next year. New York City's own economic forecasts are down this year. Albany is threatening to impose $600 million in budget cuts and shifts that may impact our ability to educate our children, provide financial assistance to families in need, and deliver health services to vulnerable New Yorkers. To limit this impact, the mayor has set a savings goal of $750 million for the city. This belt tightening will require agencies to identify inefficiencies and redundancies in their budgets. While EDC isn't a city agency and cannot achieve this goal by reducing the amount of expense funding we receive from the city, we are prepared to do our part to contribute to the solution. We will participate in the PEG program through increased payments. In addition to our annual contract payment, land sale revenue, and 42 DP revenue that we turn over, we will provide the city with an additional $30 million in revenue support in fiscal 20. In addition to directly contributing to the city's budget, EDC supports the local economy by developing programs that strengthen neighborhoods and create good paying jobs. Over the past year, we have spearheaded major initiatives including launching WeVenture, a plan to increase access to funding for on women entrepreneurs, implementing two new NYC ferry routes with two more on the way, and building a new tech training center in Union Square 
to ensure that New Yorkers of all backgrounds have a pathway to 21st century jobs. We are proud of our work on these initiatives and our continued ability to deliver on short timelines. And across the five boroughs, there are scores of EDC projects that are just as impactful as these. I'd like to provide a snapshot of these projects, which span from Stapleton on Staten Island to Edenwald in the Bronx, and are in dozens of neighborhoods in between. They are parks, They are parks, manufacturing hubs, and discovery labs. And over the past year, we have made tremendous progress on many of them, helping to change the lives of New Yorkers and strengthen the economy for future generations. In the Bronx, EDC is bringing a much needed recreation center to the Edenwald neighborhood. This new YMCA facility will provide thousands of local fam families with a full service recreation facility that will include two pools, a basketball court, gym, and indoor track. The center will also provide childcare, after school, summer camp, wellness programs, senior adult programs, and civic classes for new Americans. For decades, local residents have tried to establish a recreation center of this size and scope. We are excited to partner with them and finally bring this facility to life. In Brooklyn, EDC is transforming the Flatbush Caton Market, a local commercial and cultural institution, into a rejuvenated mixed use community asset. We are creating a brand new expanded market that gives legacy vendors like Balkaran Jewelers an opportunity to, to sell their goods in a modern reinvigorated space. This space, which includes a commercial kitchen, digital technology lab, and textile fabrication unit, will also provide a new home for the Caribbean American Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and will continue to support small businesses and entrepreneurship through on-site programming. In addition, there will be 255 affordable homes on site. This project successfully furthers two key EDC objectives, empowering small businesses and increasing access to affordable housing. In Queens, EDC opened the second phase of Hunters Point South's 5.5 acre waterfront park. This new green space begins south of 54th Avenue and wraps around Newtown Creek to complement phase one of the park resulting in a total of 11 acres of waterfront open space in an area that sorely needs it. This urban oasis is home to wildlife, marshlands, a playground, cafe, kayak launch, and unparalleled views of Manhattan. We believe every New Yorker has the right to access world-class parks. We are pr proud to support those efforts across the city. On Staten Island, EDC is working in partnership with the Parks Department to deliver nearly 12 acres of new infrastructure and open space to the North Shore community. The project activates the formerly inaccessible Navy home port and provides first-rate recreation space adjacent to a continuous waterfront esplanade. The first five acres are already open to the public and additional seven acres are currently being designed. And just yesterday in Manhattan, we worked with the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency to release a plan to protect Lower Manhattan from climate change. This plan advances $500 million in capital projects that will protect 70% of Lower Manhattan from the effects of climate change. It also provides interim protection for vulnerable waterfront neighborhoods, like Two Bridges in Battery Park City, and makes recommendations for extending the shoreline into the East River for the remaining 30% of this area, which includes the Financial District and Seaport. These examples are just a few of hundreds that highlight how EDC serves New Yorkers and strengthens our neighborhoods. And sometimes we have projects that reach people in every corner of every borough. This year, the city budget will include $107 million in funding for NYC Ferries expansion and new routes. This includes $35 million for necessary infrastructure upgrades tied to the services expansion, which will now include Coney Island, Throgs Neck, the North Shore of Staten Island, and Manhattan's West Side. It also includes $72 million of new vessels tied to the recently announced expansion. We are grateful that the Council continues to support the ferry system, which has dramatically improved the accessibility of our waterfronts and is critical to the City's efforts to expand transit options for residents. Of course, we are always looking out for the health of our citizens while strengthen strengthening our economy in the process. Over the past year, we have made major investments in LifeSci NYC, an initiative to establish New York as a global leader in life sciences research and innovation. A priority from the outset has been establishing pipelines of talent from our universities into good paying life sciences job. This is why EDC established the LifeSci NYC internship program. 
For the past three years, we have offered hundreds of students intern summer internship opportunities in the life sciences sector. This past year, 82 students from across the boroughs were placed in internships, our highest participation ever. Moreover, 31 of these students were offered full or part-time positions following their internship, highlighting the program's success. We are also tirelessly working to protect our citizens from cyber attacks. Last year, EDC launched Cyber NYC, the city's initiative to grow the cybersecurity sector. We are now working with world-renowned partners on a suite of initiatives, including launching a global cyber center, creating an innovation hub for startups, starting initiatives to fuel commercialization and research, and building new talent pipelines to train the cyber workforce of the future. No matter the size and scope of our projects, EDC is proud to help build a fairer and stronger New York, one with better infrastructure, more opportunities for residents, and robust industries that keep our economy growing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I now welcome any questions you have. We've been joined by Councilmember Brad Lander, and thank you, President, for your testimony. Um, as usual, we have a, a large council member uh, attendance on this EDC committee, so as the council members come in, and I know they have projects in their districts or close by, we will give them all an opportunity to discuss those projects. Mm -hmm. Why don't we start with the 10-year capital strategy plan mm -hmm. and the information that you provided to our committee on your vision for that, those next coming 10 years. When you look at the first five years of that plan, there's uh, almost 3.7 billion, or 3.4 3.4 to be projected in the first five years. And then there's a drastic um, either non-calculation of what's happening through six through 10, or whether that's gonna be provided at a different time, but it would be, I would think it would be unrealistic to think that the capital plan would not include years six through 10. So if you could help us explain the timeline of that 10-year plan and why it's so front-loaded versus spending at the last six through 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the thanks for the question. You know, I think you know you're certainly referencing the you know the OMB's broader capital strategy and EDC's uh, capital budget within that. Um, I think if it's a, it's a little helpful, I can talk about EDC's budgeting strategy, and then. Uh, I think OMB is probably better prepared to talk about the cities overall, Perfect. but I'll talk about our, our budgeting approach. So we, we internally at EDC also do a 10-year budget forecast, um, and the way that we approach that um, is with a great deal of certainty um, in the next fiscal year and the fiscal year after that. Um, and of course, as you go further out, you have less fiscal certainty about what's going to happen. We know the projects that we're currently planning. We don't know what new projects we might envision in fiscal 23 or fiscal 24. So what we, what we, what we attempt to do is take the, pro the known projects and project the revenues and expenses associated with those. And then uh, for, the, for uncertainties, we put in, you know, we make conservative assumptions to ensure that there's enough budgeting capacity to have the resources that we need to be successful. So the known projects are the projects that are in force now, generating revenue and income, and mm -hmm. then then there's a sense of what the projects in the outlying years will bring in? That's yeah, that's right. So we, essentially what we do is for known projects, we put specific numbers against them. For unknown projects, we make assumptions about effectively assuming that the current trends will continue and that there will be increases over time. Um, you know, just our experience has been that that process had led to us outperforming our budget every year, which is to say that our net revenue is ahead of what we project in each fiscal year. So it, it works, it actually ends up being a fairly conservative budget strategy to just take a trend and assume that you'll continue to grow revenues and expenses at the same level. Usually we're able to grow revenues at a greater rate than, uh, uh, than just using a trend and expenses we're usually able to keep under control. So as a general matter, analogizing that to the city's approach, you know, I think that there's more certainty about the projects that are happening in the near-term fiscal years. That's why you're seeing more specificity and more projects identified. And in later, later fiscal years, there's less certainty about what's happening, so they're having to rely on trends uh, as opposed to knowing specifically what capital projects they'll identify in years eight through 10 of the capital plan, for example. Well, you, you mentioned the net revenue and that it tends to be larger than what we're actually budgeting for. Mm -hmm. Is there some percentage or a scale what we can look back on the last five years of mm -hmm. how 
different that scale yeah. was if we projected 70 and it came in 90, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd be happy to share that, um, ha happy to share that with you. Um, I think what I can tell you is that last fiscal year we projected a deficit, which is to say that that EDC's net asset balance would have declined, but uh, we ended up, uh, I think, what, about $20 million? Yes. To the positive? Yes. So we had initially projected to be um, in the red, and we ultimately were able to outperform that projection. So that's, that is historically what we've been able to do. We seek to budget conservatively so that we're in a position of uh, having some flexibility and not being uh, cash-strapped throughout the course of the year. So what would you attribute that that's a large switch from being in the from being in the red to positive 20 million? What was some of the things that changed the budget? Not spending expenses. Yeah, yeah, I think we, yeah, we're very we're just very carefully managing our expenses is 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 primarily where it is. Like, um, just keeping an eye on our expenses. We try to budget expenses conservatively, um, and I think that's the primary driver. And then the the other component of it from an EDC perspective is that. There are sometimes un unanticipated revenue events that are one-off. So we, we, we know when, for example, per certain land sales are going to occur, and we have a good sense of when how revenues on our properties are going to grow. But in a given fiscal year, um, you know, on, on occasion, there's a large payment due to a sale of a property under which we have no control, and someone owes us a payment that we can't budget for, and those one-time revenues tend to recur year over year. They're just totally unpredictable. So we don't budget for them, but it gives us an inherent cushion. So how do we break that revenue down then? How do we look at the difference between those one-time sales versus annual revenue generators versus uh, leasing city lands versus mm -hmm. actually receiving profits from projects? How is that broken down within the budget? So I would say the, major the majority of our budget is really, uh, our revenues are from our asset management department that manages all of the city properties. Um, we have a portfolio of over 500 leases. That's pretty predictable. Um, we also um, get some land sales, which we do um, try to project out over a number of years. They do tend to, s to slide from one year to another, but we do have a good sense of what is in the pipeline. I would say that the biggest swing in our budget year over year is um, maybe overly ambitious in terms of spending. Uh, we budget a lot of money to, to fund for, ex to spend on, the pro on our properties. Um, sometimes we don't get to, to actually execute on all of those projects. Uh, we do have a lot of, um, we budget a lot of funding for our own projects and just sometimes that, f that spending is not at the pace that we project. So how many city properties do we own and operate? And do we have a, for that grouping of properties, a breakdown of what those expenses are? Yeah, we do. It's, 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 we have a portfolio by, for, by portfolio approach that we'd be happy to share with you. It's, 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 I mean, it's, again, it's over 60 million square feet across the entire city, so it is an enormous portfolio. Um, happy to share uh, m more details with you in terms of how the expenses vary by project. Oh, I think that's essential for looking yeah. at budget. I mm -hmm. think just to determine what our expenses are, whether we're dealing with DIFTA, we're dealing with veterans, we're dealing with small business, yep. we still have to see where that is, where the most of costs are, where we can plan for going forward, and where maybe there can be some savings. I think we need to see that. Absolutely. So that list of properties then, whatever they may be, how is it determined that what property may be sold for a one shot versus properties that may be kept for future and those that may be developed for another project? Right. So for the, for the most part, EDC doesn't we don't have a we don't really have a significant portfolio of property at this stage that EDC controls that is available to be developed on. Um, those properties, at this point in time, are uh, usually held by other agencies. So we'll partner with them. Um, you know, for example, example. You know, frequently we'll hear from council members. They'll say, you know, there's a there's a parking lot um, in my community. Uh, I'd like to work with EDC, to, and it's a city city parking lot, and I'd like to work with EDC to understand what might be possible there. So ordinarily, it's, I'd say, most frequently driven by the council or local elected officials who come to us and say, there's this property in my district. I know it's owned by the city. Um, it's usually not EDC property, but you know, EDC is known as the organization that can work with other agencies to uh, effectuate D development and community amenities on on properties so so do we have a breakdown for that category right because that comes up like you said each council member has certain 
projects or areas within their district that the community, community board, civic yeah. groups, or homeowners will be very either interested in, concerned over. Yeah. Um, do we have a breakdown of the properties that you own and or operate or work with other interagency affiliations? We have the breakdown of our properties um, that, that we have responsibility for, and again, happy to share that. As I mean, I think the, the city's portfolio is much, much broader than EC's portfolio. Um, for that breakdown, you have to speak with DCAS. But what about when ADC does team up with small business? Or oh, yeah. Once, once, once we do that, it becomes a part of our portfolio, and that would be included in any of the numbers that we would share with you. It's just prior to that, you know, that was what I'm, I was trying to respond to your question about, you know, what is the, what is that, the vacant you know, or the municipal lot that we would love to see developed in our community? Um, that's not currently part of our portfolio. That's part of a much broader city portfolio. Might be uh, in the control of a different agency, and we frequently hear about it because of an elected official, and it wouldn't be reflected yeah, but in our. But you own. just stated that once it does become yeah. partnered with you, it becomes part of your portfolio. Yes. So it, that's that's the breakdown that we are going to need mm -hmm. in order to properly digest and understand those difference between solely owned, operated by EDC and mm -hmm. those that are then merged within EDC when mm -hmm. another agency comes through, whether it's libraries, parks, uh, ferry, yep. or something else that's going on. Happy to share that. Um, how are those projects decided? So once you do say, look, we've got our five projects from last year, and now we're going to expand, how is that decision process just handled? Yeah. So, well, I think, I think, I think you're primarily talking about capital projects. Yeah. For for now. Okay. So let's. So for capital projects, um, you know. So I think, generally, understood that EDC is a uh, is a unique tool when it comes to uh, doing capital projects. We're able because we have certain structural advantages. We're able to move more quickly in capital projects than uh, than some of our sister uh, agency partners, um, and so. I think that's effective to a degree, but if our portfolio grows too large, then suddenly uh, we're no longer able to be as effective as we as we are right now. So, it, it, it's the, the the approach that we take is we have a limited capacity um, uh, in terms of capital projects. Uh, right now, we're managing I think just over um, 70 large scale capital projects across the city, um, and and those are really focused on areas where EDC is doing other significant work in terms of economic and neighborhood development. So, for example, um, you know, in in Councilmember Menchaca's district, for example, you know, we're 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 doing capital projects in partnership with DOT because EDC has significant historic assets in his district that are industrial assets. Um, similarly, in Jamaica, uh, EDC is, is working on a series of capital projects there as a result of a comprehensive planning effort we did in partnership with the council members and the borough president uh, to pursue a comprehensive plan for Jamaica. So, so that type of planning effort, those, those are the ones, you know, that, that excites us. We like to see yeah. that there's going to be coordination by borough, mm -hmm. by each council member to envision whether it's this year, three years, five years, ten years from now. Mm -hmm. Um, we can see part of that plan. Is there going to be additional coordination through for the boroughs for future capital projects such as those? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I think first off, I would say clearly the Department of City Planning is responsible for the, the, the entire planning of the city. But when, when it's an economic development particular opportunity, again, as we believed it was in Jamaica and it certainly is in Sunset Park, um, that's where it makes sense to have EDC <coughs> play a role. Uh, how many, how many times do you share that role with DCP, Gublish, on, on that? Like, so right now you have, like you said, Department of City Planning would be the sculptor of the project, but once EDC gets involved, then it's joint coordination. Do we have a breakdown of those projects? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I wouldn't, there's no official list per se, but absolutely, I mean, we're happy to share it to you. I mean, I think that, it, for example, again, Downtown Far Rockaway. He's, that was a, one of the a major rezoning initiatives. Councilmember Richards is not here at the moment. Um, we worked very closely in partnership with him. Uh, the reason that EDC, EDC was the lead agency on that rezoning effort, we worked in partnership with city planning as well as with uh, DOT and some of our other agents, HPD, a lot of other agency partners on it. Um, why did we end up focusing on downtown Far Rockaway, for example? Because there were a significant number of city-owned 
parcels that could be potential for affordable housing and other development. So EDC had a unique role to play in both thinking through the planning and the zoning, but also in finding a way to rationalize the use of municipal property and create new opportunities in that community as a part of it. Well, well that's perfect, because you said there's a, a unique opportunity with city-owned properties that EDC could put use affordable housing and future yeah. property. How many other sites mm -hmm. that are yet to have been targeted, such as that one, that might be coming down the pipeline, and yeah. how are those decided? That's where the yeah, council wants to have those robust conversations. Absolutely. Because there can't be too many left on that size. I mean, I know we have, say, for example, Willits Point, mm -hmm. which I've seen in your budgets in the past with billions of dollars, in, and I don't see anything on it in this, this particular budget, what's in front of us. So mm -hmm. that raises a concern to me. How did we have a vision for such a large 26 acres of land, and then all of a sudden it's quiet? So yeah. those are the type of concerns and positives that we need to talk about. Right. So I think uh, you're right. I mean, I think our approach on this is exclusively to work in partnership with local elected officials, the council member or the borough president, and in some cases, state, federal officials. But generally speaking, it's a partnership with the local council member. I mean, again, certainly downtown Far Rockaway was that. Um, and our efforts, you know, we're, we're, there are other areas of the city where we're currently in conversation with council, individual council members. If they want to pursue a comprehensive planning effort focused on economic development with us, and we have the resources and capacity to do it, we certainly want to pursue that. Uh, it really just, it, it, we, would, we would never do that if the local elected officials were not interested in pursuing. <laughs> So I would like to see that approach expanded to be a borough-wide so that each delegation could now have that part of their conversation of their annual view mm -hmm. of, the, of the boroughs. They know those boroughs just as I couldn't oh, yeah. say what's going on in Brooklyn versus what's happening in Queens and we have our delegation hearings and I think that conversation would be a great conversation for on an annual basis for EDC to be there yeah. with those delegations to say these are the projects we're currently working on, these are the ones we're thinking about, let's start talking about a 10-year plan with these future projects. And I think that would be a, a much better path to that community engagement mm -hmm. involvement because it would signal, hey, within the next 10 years, there's an opportunity for these few city-owned properties that are left or one, maybe some joint efforts that you're gonna have. I'd like to see that, that effort done. So before yeah. I, I turn over the first part of the questions, we did talk about revenue mm -hmm. and how much was generated. Um, how much is returned back to the city's general fund, and how is that determined? So in fiscal 19, um, through a combination of cash payments and in-kind contributions, uh, EDC is anticipated to contribute a little bit over $100 million to uh, OMB's budget, or the city's budget. Um, that's through a combination of factors. Uh, that uh, There's a historic set of arrangements that have been worked out over decades. Um, the, the, the primarily, um, but we don't know what those historic. You may know well, what those. No, are. I mean, I'm happy, I happy to explain them in in detail. I mean, there's in, probably the single largest um, circumstance uh, is the 42nd Street properties that were uh, redeveloped in the 1990s uh, and, tra and under EDC management. Um, so we transfer. We anticipate to transfer to the city a little over $25 million in pilot as a part of that uh, initiative. Um, it's, it's a, you know, we, we turn over those revenues to the city every year based purely on what the revenues are that we receive from the, from the development. Um, and, and we have similar arrangements across the city. Uh, there's a maritime contract. We have a master contract with the city. These are, these are our large scale contracts with the city that are approved through the controller's office every year, and that's really what dictates the amount of revenues that we share. Um, obviously happy to share those contracts with you. They're quite extensive, and we spend an enormous amount of time with the controller's office going through them line by line and uh, explaining the, the rationale for them. They're, it's certainly not a secretive process, but we're happy to go through with, with you and your committee in much more detail. Well. <laughs> can't just throw ferry service out there and not, yeah, <laughs> not yeah. have follow-up questions. Okay. Um, but we do, I, I want to follow up with you on the ferry service, the recent expansion mm -hmm. of it, how that was done and how that was broken down. And I also want to follow with you, um, I think is a perfect example, yesterday's exciting announcement of the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resilience Study, but something how it can be announced and kind of catch 
us off guard, but it's a great project, but something, again, that we really didn't have a discussion on, but is now being presented to the city. Those are the type of projects, as, as ambitious and forthright they need to be, those are some of the things that we'd say, well, how did a $500 million project go forward without that coming up? So mm -hmm. what I'd like to do is turn over to Councilmember Peter Koo, since my brother from Flushing over here had mm -hmm. some questions. We'll start with Councilmember Koo. After Koo is uh, Councilmember Machaka, Adams, and Lander. Thank you, Chair Avalon, and thank you, uh, President uh, Pat Patrick and, uh, from EDC. And I want to thank you for making contributions, making major contributions to the prosperity of New York City. Yeah. So uh, I have a question. Uh, go back, going back to 2010, I worked with EDC to secure a $2.25 million small business assistance mm -hmm. program for local small business surrounding EDC's Flushing Commons project. Mm -hmm. That funding is coming to an end. But Flushing Commons is still only maybe half finished, not even half finished, I think. Yeah. And local business, uh, are mom and pop stores, and they need the support. So is there a way to extend the program? <coughs> yes. Hmm? Um, so yes, so the, the, you're talking about the Union Street mar merchants. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So as, as as I know, you're well aware, we had worked in partnership with the, with you and the Asian American Foundation. Yeah. As a, a Federation. Yeah. Federation. Yeah. Sorry. Um, to um, with Joanne and um, mm. to to as as a means of distributing the the funding most effectively to the businesses. Um, we would be very happy to sit down with you. There are we actually have funds that remain and that we would be happy to uh, work out an arrangement that is the most effective way to ensure that the businesses are being supported. We realize there's more work to be done in the development. We realize that the merchants need support. And really, we want the money in the hands of the merchants so that they can be successful. Um, and we're prepared to continue to commit resources to that. And in, in through whatever mechanism, um, you know, Obviously, meeting, standing, standing by the rules and obligations of procurement, but through whatever mechanism uh, is most effective to support those merchants, so that they can uh, respond effectively to the ongoing development. Okay. Yeah. So, can you tell me, like, on the other part of the project, how soon they will start? I mean, they have. I, I don't see they do anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, they've they have exercised the option, which gives them um, uh, 12 months to start construction. So, 12 months from now? Uh, they, they recently exercised that option. So we're hopeful that they'll start construction within the next year. Ultimately, in it, it, is, an, it is at their option, but if they don't, if, if within a certain period of time, if they fail to start construction, then we can take, potentially take the property back and uh, consider reissuing an RFP to a new developer. Oh, okay. So you give them uh, 12 more months? Yes. They have further extensions. Okay, there may be one further extension beyond that, but ultimately, if they don't start construction, they have to pay a so fee. It's a long time. It's 12 months, and another extension is 24 months, two years. Uh, well, I mean, oh. I, I was not definitely not EDC president in 2010 when this was the arranged. We just have to abide by the rules of the contract. But mm. if again, why don't I think it would maybe the thing most sensible thing to do would be for if if you'd be open to it for you and we and the developer to sit down and talk about what their plans are and try to get some clarity from them about when they're going to start construction on the second phase. Okay, yeah. So please give us an update on, uh, on the project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a second question. Is on You mentioned on your testimony about building a new tech training center in Union Square mm -hmm. to ensure the New Yorkers of all backgrounds have a pathway to 21st century jobs. Can you give me a little bit detail on this? What, what kind of, uh, is there a school or what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's a, this is a project we worked on in partnership with Councilmember Rivera um, that was approved through uh, the City Council last year um, and is breaking ground um, or, or start, starting demolition within the next couple of weeks. So it'll be open in about two years. Um, so it is, a, it is a combination of office space, um, uh, 
step out space and training in classroom space uh, in partnership with not-for-profit community organizations. Um, we expect through there to train almost 50,000 students every year in tech training skills. So it is an enormous opportunity to reach students all over the city. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the objective is, of course, to co-locate companies where there are job opportunities as well. So you can train people not just for general tech skills, but for specific skills that are going to be hired for in the building. That's interesting, because I'm the chair of the tech committee. Mm -hmm. So yes. um, I hope you will get me, give me more details about this, though. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Council Member Machaka. Thank you, Chair, and welcome, uh, welcome back, President Patchett. Uh, I, I want to also just highlight that uh, we continue to enjoy uh, a really productive relationship with EDC and Sunset Park and Red Hook, and uh, it's just so important to highlight that and acknowledge your work on the ground uh, with your team. So thank you so much for for that continued partnership. I think you use that word partnership because it's it's not only true, but it's so important that that, that continues. And so just thank you. Um, I want to look at some of the work that you're doing in, in light of the ferries. And there's a lot of money and investment. I think we've seen some incredible response from the community. Uh, there's a hub concept that uh, is still in process, and so mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about Hub Port 2 mm -hmm. and the process that you're taking? There's multiple sites that you're looking at, and and it doesn't sound like you've made a decision, um, and but there's a number associated with the funding. Mm -hmm. So how does that? How do, how do you kind of balance both the we're planning, haven't figured a site, mm -hmm. and and the money that you'll need? Is that enough? Yep. Thank you for the question. Yep. So when we Last year, when we realized the dramatic level of demand for the ferry system, um, so we had originally anticipated 4.6 million riders a year. Um, last year, we realized that with the existing system, we anticipated about 9 million passengers a year, so effectively double what we had originally projected. Um, and that was before the system expansion, where we now expect close to 11 million passengers a year. Um, so when we realized the level of demand that we were experiencing, uh, we took a step back and we said we need to expand the fleet because we need twice as many boats to handle twice as many people. So recognizing that we had more vessels, we also needed a place to uh, to have them dock at night um, and also to undergo maintenance. Um, so the current facility is at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, but it only has sufficient capacity to handle the first, um, first set of vessels, which is a little bit over 20. Um, and we recognized we needed an additional facility for that. Um, so as a part of the decision to expand the fleet, uh, we requested and received $65 million to uh, build a second home port. Um, that was based on an analysis that we've done based on waterfront work that we do across the city of the rough cost per slip of building an additional slip per vessel as well as a corresponding maintenance facility to uh, work on and do maintenance for the for the vessels. So we, that was their best estimate at the time. We're still evaluating alternative sites across the city. Um, you know, there as there is one site in your district that we've talked about that's a possibility. Um, we want to continue to talk. And that's about the Atlantic Basin for people who are listening. Um, so uh, you know, we look forward to continuing to discussing discussing the possibilities there and other places. And uh, you know, we'll be in conversations about it. And the only thing that I want to, uh, and I only have time for one more question, so the only thing I want to say there is, uh, will it include master planning for whatever site? Uh, I'm assuming that this is, this is going to be a big operation, and so uh, if Red Hook gets chosen, um, the, the basin area is, uh, is prime and ripe for master planning. And there's a cruise ship terminal. There's a great nonprofit port side there. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work there that can help with master planning. Will that include master planning as part of the, the kind of rollout and work? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, certainly it would need at a minimum a comprehensive plan for the facility. And happy, happy to talk to you about what other, you know, uh, you know. Again, it's we haven't determined where exactly it would go, and we want to continue to discuss it with you. Um, I think the. Ideally, it would be co-located with the current Brooklyn Navy Yard facility, um, but you know, there are other 
other possibilities and there are constraints there. So if it, if it ends up uh, being um, in a different neighborhood, we would you know, want to work closely to ensure that we're thinking comprehensively about uh, how to do it and plan effectively for it. Awesome. And I, I think that's the only main point is that I think, I think that's smart and I'm glad that, that you're open to that and let's keep working on that. Uh, in my last 30 seconds, uh, I'm actually wanting to kind of point out to the, the preparation for, for assisting in the budget, you're bringing dollars back into the budget, mm -hmm. and really the recession con conversation, how, how do you prepare as EDC, as a non-agency, to prepare for a recession? Uh, what happens to your budget? How do you, how, how do you prepare? What, what did you do, what did EDC do back in 2007? Mm -hmm. uh, just give us a sense about how you're thinking about that. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think what we've experienced historically, um, so we're not, uh, EDC, we don't receive tax revenues in the way that the city does. So the way that we're impacted by a recession is vacancy rates um, on our properties. Uh, you know, right now our, you know, we, I think our vacancy rate citywide, it's below, I mean, it's very small. It's less than 5%, it might be less than 2%. Um, so we are highly occupied um, because our, uh, rental rates are intended to be below market. Um, we don't generally have a lot of impact on vacancy or revenues as a result of a recession because, you know, as you know, if you're paying 10 or $15 per square foot in rent at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, it's still by far the cheapest rent that you can get anywhere. So uh, companies, ideally, our goal is to ensure that we have affordable rents that will allow companies to sustain themselves even in a recession. And the result of that is we don't see enormous impacts on vacancy, but we do, when we're anticipating a recession, make more conservative assumptions about vacancy rates and therefore, uh, therefore spending, and that's what we did in the last recession. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Chaka. You brought up the, the ferry service, so I'm just gonna add maybe two questions so we can have a, maybe finish off that, mm -hmm. that section of what EDC is doing there. Uh, I've yet to run into anybody who said, I don't want a ferry. Maybe the location may be um, questioned and maybe where they should go in light of both the administration and the speaker looking for greener alternatives and trying to give different transportation alternatives. I am in that group of people as a fan of this program. In fact, I think both Council Member Rose and I have separate bills calling on a ferry-wide, citywide agency to leave you of all that amazing work that you're doing, but to have a full focus on a ferry agency. Um, neighborhoods still aren't in this plan. Mm -hmm. Obviously mine is one of those, but there are, and, and we're like, we like the Rockaways in Staten Island, can't get any further away, but we don't have a train and we're forced to drive mm -hmm. or take a bus that takes forever. Th this expansion is calling for five additional routes by uh, in the summers of 2017-18, which will connect 21 landings. And by year 2021, there'll be a total of eight routes. How many of them are new? And how many of those didn't make the cut that may be looked at for the next round? Right, of course. Okay, so, we, so the system currently has 20 stops on it. Um, we're gonna be adding uh, one additional stop at the Brooklyn Navy Yard this summer, which has been planned for some time. Um, and then uh, recently we announced the addition of stops at Throgs Neck, um, Coney Island, Staten Island, and two on the west side of Manhattan. So technically that adds five additional stops to our system, so it would take it to 26 stops overall. Uh, we're adding, it's really only uh, two new routes uh, it's going to add Con the Coney Island route, which will be a new uh, new route, as well as the Staten Island route, which is new. The Throgs Neck extension is uh, is on to our existing Soundview route. So comprehensively... So if a route's just expand extended, it's not a new route, it's just getting a new spot further out versus a brand new route. Correct. Being planned. In other, which is to say, you know, it's like, I mean, it's like the Second Avenue subway. It was an extension of the Q train. There's st it's still a Q train. Um, the, uh, so what we did was we, this, this was a, for the Throgs Neck as an example, it stops at Pier 11, 34th Street, um, the, and, and then in Soundview in the Bronx, or sorry, then on the Upper East Side, and then in Soundview in the Bronx, so it had uh, 
four stops on it, and we're adding a fifth stop in Throg's Neck, which will be the first and last stop uh, on the northeast end of the route. See, we saw Th Throg's Neck, and we got very excited because we're on the other side. I know. The Throg's Neck. I said, like, great, we're getting a Throg's Neck. I said, no, that's the Bronx Throg's Neck. Yeah. We want the Queen's Throg's uh -huh. Neck. Right, I understand. But at some point, you're going to have to figure that one out. Absolutely. Well, we did, you know, as, as we discussed, we did a, a comprehensive analysis of every, uh, every viable site across the city. We did um, extensive community engagement as a part of that. We met comprehensively um, in each borough and it did a number of site visits. Uh, the, ultimately, uh, we f what we did was we extended routes to the most viable next set of routes, but as the mayor has said and as we've said, once we complete the expansion, this level of expansion, we're gonna look at it trying to take the next step the goal is to continue to have this serve as many people as possible. Um, and you know, and the mayor has also said, as the system grows and is of, of more interest to people, more and more sites become uh, viable because of the level of demand for the system. Well, to your credit, we did exactly that. You sponsored with the Queen's delegation um, at the borough president's office for an option for every community board and the council members to look at the coastal areas of Queens mm -hmm. and talk about future stops. And that was exactly what this committee's been calling for, that type of approach. Um, unfortunately, though, the stops that were brought up at that didn't make the cut, but those were the type of interaction that I think from when we took this spot on is what we wanted to see, and I want to thank you for that. But yeah. um, I really, and the last thing I'll ask on the ferries, to me, you mentioned a parks project that is unable to work through the city field marina. Um, to me, I think, Again, it's not my district, it will benefit all of Queens, that spot. How do we work through or with that project so we don't lose the opportunity of the greatest park and ride spot next to the seven train with a huge parking lot on the water with an existing ferry um, dock slip that's already ready to go with an LaGuardia expansion that's bursting at the seams. To me, this spot is screaming for Queens North relief and we're still not getting it. Well, the, uh, the I, I know the site that you're referring to, the marina, right? Mm -hmm. um, the city field marina. City field marina, right. So it's, it's not an EDC project or property. It's a parks department property, as you alluded to. They are in construction, a uh, somewhat, you know, a, a several year construction project or they're envisioning for that site, is my understanding. Um, and uh, I think from our perspective, I'd be happy to you know, to get together with them and talk about what the possibilities are. I'm not familiar with the absolute latest on that because it's not an EDC property, but I agree it has a lot of potential. It's right by LaGuardia. Um, it's well served, obviously, by the Grand Central Parkway, um, and it's, an, it's a place, a thing that we should look at. Thank you. And now Council Member Adams and then Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. President Padgett, good to see you. Oh, always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, I too want to echo the sentiments of um, my colleague, Councilmember Menchaca. Partnership with EDC, um, specifically for myself and um, and my uh, constituents in uh, in Southeast Queens, uh, particularly on the Jamaica Now mm -hmm. effort, have been very successful. And uh, thank you again for your partnership, continued partnership with us on that great effort for the Downtown Jamaica Core. I just have a couple of questions um, that revolve around job growth because we are looking at revitalization uh, in our area. How does EDC specifically see its role in generating stronger job growth? That's a, it's a great question. Um, so I think we look at it from two perspectives. Um, the first is a neighborhood perspective, which is where, where there are opportunities, as we've talked about, for neighborhood planning that lead to job opportunities in local areas. Um, we want to partner, partner with the local communities, the community boards, the elected officials, council members in particular, to identify what those opportunities are. I mean, I think the Jamaica Feast program is a great example of that in your district. I hope that you share that. Um, it's been very successful. We have our fourth, fourth co cohort now that's going through the program, which uh, is going to have 67 graduates. Um, and we are looking to, um, from my perspective, continue and expand the program. Um, so that's an example of a real a neighborhood-based community development, economic development opportunity where we see a real, a real possibility to do something in a community um, that's job-focused. 
Similarly, citywide, we look at places where there are industries that we see an opportunity for the city to play a role at a particular moment to change the trajectory of the city's participation in that industry. Um, you know, one example I gave that I really believe in is our cybersecurity efforts. Cybersecurity is a growing industry, um, has widely accessible jobs um, to people of a variety of education and skill levels, and they're good paying jobs. So what we sought to do as a part of that effort is both make investments that are more likely to bring the industry here, but also investments in workforce development initiatives to go alongside of it to ensure that we're not just creating jobs, but we're also creating pathways to those jobs for New Yorkers. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And in looking at um, MWBEs, yes. uh, do you by any chance have a gender breakdown of jobs that EDC has created? I, I don't have a gender breakdown in front of me, but happy to follow up with the best information we have on that. I can tell you EDC's staff is um, uh, very uh, well represented in that regard, so, and also at the senior management levels. Okay. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And now we'll hear from Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's good to see you here. And, and I'll begin also with some uh, words of gratitude for our partnership. This is the first time we've had the opportunity for a public exchange uh, since Amazon. And, and I just want to say that despite the challenges and tensions that that presented, I appreciated your coming here from the very beginning. I think I asked you my first questions about those that deal mm -hmm. years ago, probably at one of these budget hearings. Mm -hmm. um, and you consistently gave us straightforward and honest answers when we liked them and when we didn't like them. Um, you know, and it matters to have somebody who's, whose word we trust and who we can be in dialogue with when we agree and, and when we strongly disagree. So I want to say thank you for that and not like just pretend like it never happened. Thanks. We can, um, we can hug it out later. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, but to the matters at hand today, yeah. um, a few budget questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think w one thing that you and I have talked about before, and it just seems to me even more true today than ever, and especially given yesterday's announcement, I mean, you're really running two separate agencies with two different missions. Like, you run our economic development agency that helps bring economic vitality and jobs and all the things you would think of as economic development, and then you run a capital projects management agency, which has got a 1,000 capital projects, some yours and some that other agencies choose you for instead of DDC or get chosen for instead of DDC including some of the biggest ones, like yesterday's announcement of uh, climate protection. And um, d those are two pretty different missions, yes? I think, there are, I think infrastructure has long been understood to be the underpinning of economic development. So they're not they're, contradictory, for sure. I would but. say they're <laughs> essential. I mean, I think you would agree. I mean, you're well versed in these matters. Transportation infrastructure are at the core of economic development. So that doesn't mean that we should be a transportation agency. It doesn't mean that we should be the the infrastructure agency. But it, I, to me, it does mean that we have to have those tools in our tool belt where essential and where it's complementary to economic development to be able to play those cards because it's making a lot of analogies here. But it's, it's really important for, uh, you know, to, for, if, for example, again, we're talking about um, Sunset Park, we have you know, over 4 million square feet of industrial assets there. We need to have the capacity to be able to build out the roads there to make sure that they can serve the trucks that are coming in to serve those businesses. That's the capital component of our agency. And I should be, I'm not trying to break no, EDC up because this no. is not about your monopoly power or something <laughs> that we've got to be split into two parts. I, yeah. I just, and I, you're of course right that we have to have strong infrastructure to have a strong economy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that's really the rationale for which infrastructure projects, as far as I can tell, wind up at EDC. Some of them are directly related to economic development. Some of them like the Lower Manhattan climate protection. I mean, you can, you're right, Lower Manhattan is a critical economic piece of our infrastructure, but that's like fundamental to the future of our city. It's not narrowly economic development. And I love the rink in Prospect Park. It's magnificent, and your agency did a great job, but that was not economic development. So my point here is not that there's a contradiction. I think you actually do both those things well. I'm trying to pay a little, and I'm today going to focus a little less on your economic development mission, which broadly I actually think we share values on and you do in ways that I think are 
uh, appropriate and, and help the city a lot. On the capital projects management and infrastructure management side, we have a disconnected set of systems that are not serving us as well as they need to. And you guys actually deliver more on time and on budget than DDC does or some of the other agencies. So um, it's no criticism that you guys are good at capital projects management. Mm -hmm. But as you know, I want a more comprehensive and clear and coherent system where all the capital projects uh, are tracked transparently. It can, we can compare them with each other. Mm -hmm. We understand what's working and what's not working. When some contractor over here isn't doing a good job, we know it over there. And we don't have that today. And the, the administration has agreed to work with us more strongly on it. Um, but I think it's going to involve more coordination than we yet have. So uh, let me just start with a tracking question. Your large projects, over $25 million, are in the city's capital projects tracker. But I presume a lot of those 1,000 capital projects you are managing are under $25 million. So how do you track those internally? And what do you tell us about them publicly? Uh, right. So, um, so the way that we, that we think about them is on a comprehensive basis. You're right. The larger scale projects obviously show up in the, in the large scale tracker. And then we do it really on a, I say neighborhood by neighborhood basis because frequently the projects are working together. Um, so for example, we have a number of projects in Inwood that we're pursuing now coming out of the rezoning effort there. <clears throat> and we have a comprehensive you know, tracker that says where are we on each of uh, each of those projects. Similarly, we have a, a concept in uh, the in the Sunset Park area which shows how we're progressing on each of those projects. And then you know, the ferry is another example where it's dozens of capital projects all over the city at any given time, and it's really reflected in our weekly meetings about the ferry system. And we go through a we think of it as a sort of red, yellow, green approach, which is, is it green? Great, we don't need to talk about it. Is it yellow? Then we you know, need to pause on it, and if it's red, we need to spend some serious time troubleshooting. Mr. Chair, can I ask another question or two? Always, Council Member Lamb. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so on the cap, do you have for capital projects in particular, or not, you know, so, um, some project management software that the agency uses? Yeah, absolutely. And have you been in any dialogue with DDC as they're looking at developing new capital projects management software mm -hmm. about what they might learn from you or you from them? We've been in discussions with them, but I think to your point, we could, I think more discussions are probably helpful. I'd be happy to, to do that. I mean, obviously, um, Commissioner Grillo is, is, is very effective and, um, you know, uh, Jamie Torres Springer is a great addition to the team, so we're excited to work with, with them. Um, I know they recently put out a new blueprint for their approach, um, and I'm excited that they're thinking in new ways. And I think to the extent, I mean, you know, they're uniquely familiar with EDC's uh, history and experience, and we'd be happy to work with them, and in fact, frequently, frequently do work with them. But in terms of the strategic planning, if, if, if they'd be interested in talking to us, we'd be happy to do it. So I just want to maybe push you to do that okay. and ask that it be, we have a commitment from the administration on getting to a yeah. capital projects tracking system. Mm -hmm. But I don't think what we want is kind of something like set on top of everybody's different systems. Mm -hmm. One, it's like very labor intensive because someone has to like pull it out of each system. And two, that's not really, it might help get the public some basic transparency, but it won't help us learn, see patterns, learn lessons, and do projects better. Mm -hmm. And what I'm pushing for is not only to get a kind of tracking system, but somewhat better coordination. You're right, the work they're doing at DDC that Lorraine and Jamie are leading is great, but, and they're putting a whole new system in place, but like if their system is good, but over here, and your system is over there, and SEA's system is over here, mm -hmm. Um, that's less good than one that really is in dialogue with each other. So I just, I'm going to take you, uh, I'm going to appreciate your saying yes and just ask you, let's, uh, we'll keep working with Mayor's Office of Operations on the sort of formal tracker, but having these things start to get a little looking down the road to where we actually could have a more coherent and integrated system mm -hmm. uh, would be of great value. So thank you for, uh, for agreeing to work with them on that. And then my last question, which is, is narrowly a budget question, goes to yesterday's announcement as well, mm -hmm. um, which I, you know, that is absolutely critical work. I'm glad you guys are at, at the center of it. You know, one of the things that, that got noted yesterday is um, the amount of money that we're putting in right now is far, far, far short of what right. will be needed over time. 
even within the terms of the 10-year capital strategy that was underway to build that project out. And on the one hand, I understand we'll need federal funds and more partners and hopefully a Green New Deal. But on the other hand, um, it is a, we need to build that project, whether there's a Green New Deal or not, whoever's the President of the United States, like whether we get federal and state funding. So I, I was, you know, the mayor sort of gave a forward-looking answer in some ways, but I guess I want to push a little more, like how do we balance between, yes, mm -hmm. the reality that you have to put some money in the budget next year, and it wouldn't be realistic for us to say the city's going to pay every penny of that, with the fact that we need to build these projects and we have to figure out yeah. where those revenues are coming from and how we're going to do it and mm -hmm. and be moving forward in a way that is not kind of if we get the money we'll finish them but we're going to do these projects and we're going to figure out how yeah absolutely i think you're you're completely right i guess i would say you know i want to just step back for a second and look at all of lower manhattan so east side coastal resiliency um which covers the area um, east of Stytown down to the Manhattan Bridge. That's a $1.4 billion project from which the city received $335 million from the federal government. The remainder of that is in the city's capital budget. Um, going further south, the Two Bridges project, um, which will cover the area between the Manhattan and the Brooklyn Bridges, uh, that area we have the full funding for. It's uh, over 200, about $200 million, including a mix of federal funds and likely some city funds. That's moving forward. We're designing it. We're going to start construction within two years. Um, Battery Park, the city allocated $108 million for that project. Uh, we have some additional funds for it comprehensively. We're designing that project. We're going to build it. We have the funding we need. We're moving ahead. We authorized um, approximately 168 well, over $150 million for Battery Park City Authority so that they have the funds that they need to construct the waterfront improvements. Collectively, what that means is that we'll be protecting the entire Lower East Side and 70% of Lower Manhattan with projects that are fully funded and will be in construction within the next two years. So to step back, that's actually a pretty comprehensive strategy. We have the most challenging part, which is that remaining 30% of Lower Manhattan for which it's a particularly big and complicated challenge. I think, um, you know, there's, there's always this push and pull of, you know, you did all the planning in a back room um, and you presented a fully baked plan to us, where's that from? Or you don't really have a plan. I mean, what our goal is to say, we're showing our work. We've done all of the analysis. We've concluded very clearly that the only opportunity, the only option is to sh build something in the water. To, to have an overly specific project at this stage, I think would be in contrast to the, what we're always hearing from the city council, which is we want to work together on this. So we're showing our work saying, we know what we need to do, let's sit down, let's master plan together about how specifically we're going to go about that. That could be anywhere between 50 feet wide and 500 feet wide. Uh, that's what we know at this stage. We know some of the engineering that's involved. We know that we have a huge sewer investment we need to make in Lower Manhattan, but the specifics of what it's going to look like and budgeting beyond that at this point, I think um, beyond the projects where we know specifics, I think would be uh, guessing. So just to conclude, and this really takes me back to where the chair now began. You're really, now you're really on your last question. Uh, and I'm not even asking a question. <laughs> I'm just kind of praising your work here. I think this goes back to what the chair was saying about the 10-year capital strategy. Mm -hmm. That's different from a budget. Yeah. And I do think it would be appropriate. I, I like your approach. We do want to have a dialogue. We don't want you to bring us a fully baked project. Yeah. But it does seem to me we are saying in the timeline of the 10-year capital strategy, this is going to cost us on the order of another billion dollars. Mm -hmm. That should be in year four or year five. You can put a big asterisk by it that mm -hmm. says, obviously, this is an uh, estimate price, but we need the engine. Like, if we're, that's what we want, is something that helps us look at the magnitude of the projects we're going to have to do, even where you're right, we have a lot more work to do together mm -hmm. to figure out what they look like. And, and yeah, and following up on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That that program that we're just discussing, you know, where are the other waterfront borough committees? Where is Queens in that? Where is Staten Island in that? Where's Bronx in that? You know, um, on that, since we brought it up, is there coordination um, there with the Army Corps of Engineers and their vision for the waterfront because our frustration as council members is anytime you have to deal with the federal or even state 
uh, communication process, things fall off the rails. So we are so dependent, obviously, on you and EDC on being our voice for that. Is there coordination for the future projects with Army Corps on the waterfront? Yes, uh, absolutely. EDC is not um, the primary uh, agency dealing with them. It's the Office of Recovery and Resiliency who deals with the Army Corps on a comprehensive strategy to Manhattan, or to, sorry, to the city. Um, certainly, you know, there are some very large projects being looked at, um, like out in the harbor um, that could prote provide protection from uh, storm surge. Uh, you, the Army Corps, we have to work closely with them in terms of rebuilding our beaches. Even the projects that, that we talked about uh, the other day, uh, or yesterday, those projects require um, you know, Army Corps approval. So we're going to be having to work very closely with them um, as we do on all of our waterfront projects across the well, state. Well, that might be a great topic for a future joint hearing, just to hear that vision and how mm -hmm. that coordination goes so we can have that dialogue. That would be great. Thank you, Councilmember Landis. Now we have Councilmember Levine and then Councilmember Powers. Thank you so much, Chair Malone and Mr. President. Good morning. I want to follow up on, on one point that emerged in your questioning with Councilmember Lander. You can leave. It's okay if you're in a hurry. I'll, I'll brief you. We had a hearing a few weeks ago in which um, the chair of DDC, um, Lorraine Grillo, testified about the budget for the Eastside Coastal Re Resiliency Plan in which, if I'm not mistaken, she conceded that there were still several hundred million of the total budget that are not yet funded. But you just said that it's totally funded. I just want to clarify. Okay. I I, I leave it to her expertise. I know that they, they clarified the final budget with recently, and so it may not be in this, uh, the current budget, but I, I'm certain the city's committed to funding it. A major, a recurring theme in that hearing where we had a lot of community people present mm -hmm. was the fear that this would, uh, the work would begin um, and many of the amenities which the community is going to lose during the construction process will be removed and then the project would stall while we were waiting for funding. Um, so if indeed the funding is in place, that would be a relief. There are still many other concerns. Of course. Uh, but if, if you can clarify that or, or have DDC clarify Absolutely. that, that well, would be great. May I, what I can say definitively is the projects that we're specifically involved in, which are the Two Bridges project um, and the Battery Park project, uh, those projects we have the funding for and are moving ahead. Okay, great. Um, moving on to uh, another topic, uh, I'm a major fan of the ferry program. Mm -hmm. um, I love it so much that I wanted to come to the west side of Manhattan, yes. as you're well aware. And uh, I'm pleased that you've taken uh, a step in that direction by announcing that by 2021 there'll be a line um, that goes from essentially Hudson Yards to Battery Park to uh, Staten Island. Uh, I, I wonder if you could explain the logic behind that configuration. Um, talking to folks in the in the west side, in the vicinity of the Hudson Yard stop, I think there'd be greater interest to go around to Wall Street, where you can connect to the broader ferry network. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I'll follow up with questions about other stops along the west side of Manhattan, where I think there's a, a real pressing need for service as well, but if you could just clarify how you decided on that configuration for this first step. Absolutely. So we looked comprehensively uh, at locations all over the city, and what we focused on was fundamental technical feasibility and uh, ridership and costs. Those were the metrics that we used to evaluate alternatives. Um, the the, the site, this route up the west side driven by Staten Island ridership primarily um, is performed extremely well because there are a number of folks in Staten Island whose only transportation alternative is to take the existing ferry to Lower Manhattan. Um, but there are a lot of those folks who work in Midtown, and so having a direct link to Midtown, and as you say, the growing jobs uh, on the west side of Manhattan, uh, shows up in our modeling to be very effective and drive a lot of ridership. And of course, there are a lot of folks in the west side who want to commute from the far west side of Manhattan, which you know, in many places is more of a transit desert, um, and get to uh, the jobs that are available in Battery, Bar Battery Park City and vice versa. I'm glad to hear that um, this would be an important 
commuter route for Staten Islanders. Um, from the perspective of, of Manhattan, of the west side, uh, sorry to say there's not a lot of demand to commute to Staten Island in the morning, and um, there's far more demand to go to Wall Street than there is to Battery Park, but um, what I really want to push you on is the other potential locations along the west side. Mm -hmm. And as for feasibility, um, you know, I focused a lot on 125th Street, where we already spent 30 plus million on a fabulous pier that's gone almost totally unused. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that you have done feasibility work, looking at ridership demand, but um, there, is, there is intense growth in that area with an entire new campus emerging yep. right next to that, which will have thousands of students and staff. Um, and really, the, the, the train that would be the alternative north-south route for most of these neighborhoods, the one line, um, is intensely crowded. Um, anyone who commutes on that line, as I do a lot of days, has had the experience of having to let more than one train go by mm -hmm. because you just can't get on. Uh, and uh, uh, my time is, is, is up, but I do want to point out that there are other obvious stops along the west side, like um, I guess it would be Pier 79, or, or, sorry, the one that's 57th Street, mm -hmm. um, which is a commercial pier, not part of Hudson River Park. Huge transit desert in an area where development has been um, yep. pretty significant mm -hmm. for the last five years, thousands of new housing units. Um, and there are some smaller stops, like around Houston, 14th Street, maybe the West 79th Street boat basin. There are limitations in Hudson River Park, and some of those smaller stops, you could only do a, a water taxi, which would be 99 seats or less. But you could have a wonderful system with an express line, maybe from 125th, even starting at Dykeman, 125th, Hudson Yards, uh, and then local stops uh, where you would have to use a smaller boat. That to me would be just a fabulous new transportation network where we're adding housing, we're adding employment, we have an over overcrowded train line. There's a very compelling case for that kind of arrangement. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. You're, it's, it's, it is compelling. Um, you know, we, and you're right, there's going to be a huge amount of growth in that area. So I think what, what we've tried to do is, you know, focus the, the current lines on what we know is the immediate demand and what's expected uh, in the very near future. But the opportunity is, as you say, as these areas grow, we need to continue to evaluate them. And it's our commitment that the route you're referring to, actually the West Side route, will be open next year, 2020 not 2021, um, and so then we'll need to continue to evaluate what are ways that we continue to expand the system, and we'll work very closely with you on that. And, and very quickly then, I'm done. Is there money in the budget now then for the 2020 opening in yes. this fiscal year? Do you know how much is devoted to the West Side project? Well, from a capital perspective, there's not, those peers are already in place. So we, we, have, we have funding for, for Staten Island, the Staten Island pier, that we're, or the slip that we're going to need to build out in Staten Island. Um, and then, for the, obviously, for the vessels. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I like when you get excited and toss around words like fabulous new projects, Councilman. That gets, gets us all excited when you like fabulous projects. We like that. So now we have Councilmember Powers, then Barron, and I believe we have four panels. So hang in there. Once the council members are done, then each of the panels will come up and speak, and then we'll conclude. Councilmember Powers? All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. I'm sorry I missed your testimony. I was. Uh, is running around my district, but nice to see you guys. Um, I want to ask a few different topics. But I want to start with the East Midtown uh, and the Greenway. Um, in 2017, the mayor announced $100 million in funding for the East Midtown Greenway. Uh, I think in the budget this year, it's of roughly around $123 million. As you know, many of the constituents in my district and in Councilman Kalos's district have been frustrated with the design process and going into the siting process of um, of, of the project, and I wanted to just get a quick understanding of what accounts for the increase of the $23 million on the project. Uh, the, the, so uh, we put in $100 million. I mean, it was at that point we didn't have a specific design. So to the point of the conversation we were having earlier, we did our best to come up with a rough estimate. It was a round number of what we thought that it would cost, and then we went and comprehensively uh, bid out the project, designed it, 
in consultation with the community, um, and ultimately the cost was of the 123 million was was what we came up with. Okay, so reality of spending the money versus the budgeting for it would be the. Yeah, I mean, I would just say we're a, a, a rough estimate versus an actual contract for construction. Okay, thanks. Um, the Greenway is intended to extend it, the East River Esplanade uh, from 61st in this, this portion, 61st to 53rd Street. And there's a plan here to complete the entire loop so that all Manhattan has uh, waterfront parkland. And um, the UN Esplanade obviously has not been funded in this budget, and I, as I believe, it doesn't have a, a anticipated funding. There was a source of it that's Essentially, I think we can agree has fallen fallen short of mm -hmm. um, becoming reality. So, um, it, what what is the plan to create to, the full Esplanade to complete the UN Esplanade? And I and I and I ask this in context of I think some folks' beliefs that the bridge at 54th Street is is really intended to be the the last spot to get off because there's no further ability to get to build a, an exit further down. So I'm wondering if what's the entire the entirety of the plan and is there a plan to fund the rest of the esplanade uh, down to the UN? Well, you're you're correct. The um, there was a source that was envisioned which involved a UN project uh, which at this stage does not appear to be moving forward, but um, you never know. Uh, and so that would certainly be uh, the the ideal identified source of funding. In the absence of that, it has to compete with other city capital priorities, um, and you know that's a consultation process between uh, the, the mayor and the council. And I mean, certainly, I'm a believer in that project. I would love to see that project get funded. Um, I want to see the uh, the greenway get extended and be continuous, so you don't have to exit the greenway and go along First Avenue and then get back on the greenway at 63rd or 50, even 54th. Um, I think it will be a great amenity for the whole city. It'll be a great attraction for people from around the world. Um, it's a long-term capital project. It's a very expensive capital project. Um, Do you have the cost for, for what it would cost for the? I mean, I think the I original. Don't have, I don't have it in front of me. My recollection is three or four hundred million dollars. Got it. Uh, I, I and I, I just want to be on the record. I fully. Sh fully support getting the yes, the waterfront access. I think the a the one question is about having an actual completed mm -hmm. uh, down to the UN, and two is um, then the logistical uh, challenges created when you don't have it um, going all the way. But I think that on a, in a borough of water, of surrounded by water, access to it is is uh, important and, and, and really uh, recognizably missing. Um, the, uh, I want to move to a different topic. Uh, both the chair, Valone, and I have been talking. We did a hearing around tourism and, mm -hmm. and uh, job growth created by tourism and spending. I, as you know, have uh, a number of um, revenue generating uh, cultural institutions. I have Times Square, Bryant Park, mm -hmm. a number of other institutions and, and places, destinations in my district. And, um, you know, I think we, we often lose track of exactly how important that is to our economy in New York City to have, I mean, in many cases, other people come and spend their money here to support yeah. jobs. Can you give us? Um, one of the things we've been talking about is both to have better tracking of information exactly so we can then also uh, have a better understanding of how like events or institutions drive those tourism dollars to have better data. And second, to look, think of other ways that the council can be supportive of the city's efforts to uh, continue to make that number grow. Yeah. Um, certainly, things like a str you know strong dollar and uh, and uh, and a safe city are part of it. But other, do, do you guys have, has the ESD, uh, EDC come up with um, a, any other recommendations that you think the city or the council could be looking at to uh, help enhance the uh, tourism industry in New York City? I think, it's, I think it's a great question. Um, tourism is very important to our economy. I think you're right; it's sometimes underappreciated. Uh, you know, clearly, the, you know, the primary uh, organization responsible for tourism in the city is New York City and mm -hmm. Company. Uh, we work in close partnership with them. Um, they're 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 a great organization. I think one of the things that's most exciting, um, maybe not for you, but for the city, um, is what we've been focusing on in this administration, which is to expand the reach of tourism beyond Manhattan. Because um, in many cases, you say you're right, many of the cultural institutions in your neighborhood are full. Um, you know, they're teaming with people. We can handle a little bit more. Yeah, you can That's handle a bit more. Um, but there are other great places. You know, there's the Botanical Gardens in the Bronx and Brooklyn. Um, 
there's the fa fabulous uh, BAM in downtown Brooklyn. Um, I think what we have to do and what EDC is focused on is trying to create and expand more cultural hubs across the city so that people can will draw more overall visitors, more visitors to uh, Midtown and Central Manhattan as well, but also there are more things to see because you, you, know, you can only go to see the Statue of Liberty so many times. So what you want to have the you know, Brooklyn Bridge Park, you need to continue to add iconic new tourism destinations for people across the city to keep drawing people year after year. Got it. Well, if there's if there's specific recommendations that the council can can uh, be a partner on around yeah. uh, improving that we and, and highlighting for what it's worth mm -hmm. too, we we'd love to be part of that conversation. Um, just one last, if 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 it's okay, um, the I want to talk about East Midtown rezoning mm -hmm. and uh, your office, I think a bit, but also the um, the deputy mayor's office and and city planning and others were uh, have been and were involved in many of the projects or, or in the initial rezoning and then sort of the product tracks are coming forward. J.P. Morgan has come forward to put their headquarters. I think 15,000 jobs mm -hmm. staying in Midtown. We've seen I think three or four other buildings be announced as part of this. Can you talk to us about just the EDC's viewpoint in terms of the uh, the importance and then the sort of the so the, the I guess the initial uh, uh, results of the East Midtown rezoning and, and 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 secondly whether it's replicable anywhere else in the city I think it's fantastic I think that I think the East Midtown rezoning greater greater East Midtown rezoning uh, is one of the smartest economic development things that uh, that we've undertaken together um, I think as to your point we've actually seen uh, more quick success than I think even we could have anticipated. I think the expectation was that, you know, we all knew that the, the East Midtown needed a refresh, um, that the buildings, many of the buildings were not modern office buildings, that we needed to update them so it can, can, could continue to be competitive as a global uh, commercial center. And what we've seen is that people have taken us up in that regard. We have one Vanderbilt obviously well under construction uh, the recent announcement of the possibility of uh, additional um, office tower and hotel on the uh, the Grand Hyatt site, which um, you know I think is an interesting opportunity, as you mentioned, J.P. Morgan, uh, and then the fact that those uh, those projects come with critical transportation investments for the community, it's really a fantastic win-win. I'm excited to see how it plays out. Uh, I'd love to be able to replicate it in other parts of the city. I'm not sure if the if that precise set of ingredients is is necessarily available elsewhere, but obviously happy to talk about it. Yeah, appreciate that. I, I think it's I think it's working so far. It, it it stimulated activity in a way that none of us could anticipate. Um, JP Morgan was an anticipated exactly. site in that project, and I do encourage as we have a, a we've had and are having a conversation about job creation and large job creation in the city in the last few months and moving yeah. forward. That part of this is about also zoning and then also addressing public infrastructure. And one of the ways we can do that is through looking at um, you know, opening up opportunities uh, uh, that would let people monetize proactively in addition to all the other things we do in the city. So um, uh, thanks. Uh, thank, thanks for the questions. Thank you. So thank you, Commissioner Councilmember Powers, and I also thank you for your leadership on the tourism. In fact, we had our very first hearing at the TW Hotel, TWA Hotel Lounge at One World Trade Center, just folks. I have to tell you, ever since we've joined forces and focused on that, the attention bringing to the economic generated through tourism industry has skyrocketed, and we've been continuing those conversations to yes. see how we can support and grow that on the five borough approach. That's something we're always saying it's beyond that and how we can help, and I thank the EDC for that also. We also have uh, final questions from Council Member Barron, and then we'll, I'm just going to sum up and then get to our panel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. Uh, according to the land sale list that you published, uh, EDC sold three plots of city land, and I don't know if this question was already asked, but we wanted to find out, I wanted to know, uh, particularly about the project called JEMB Alby Square in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I believe it's in Brooklyn. If you could tell me a little bit about that project and how it's moving forward. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a project we worked um, on partnership with uh, the city council on council member Levin. Uh, that was a, that, that was a, a so you were there, so you were there. Uh, it was a, you were, it, yeah. was, it was a halo, so. 
Yeah, okay. yeah. That was that was a that was a partnership with Councilmember Levin. Um, it's a uh, it's it's what we have seen in downtown Brooklyn historically was that originally the there was a, from the re going back in the rezoning from the early 2000s the expectations was that there would be a mix of residential and commercial office development that would happen, but unfortunately the residential de development happened and commercial development really didn't take place. Right. So what we were able to do is having this EDC having air rights available, we were able to encourage people to build office space as opposed to residential space. So that was what that opportunity was about. And what we've really seen as a result of a number of these opportunities um, is that we have uh, been able to finally see real commercial office, new commercial office happening in, okay. in downtown Brooklyn. So when, e decide, when EDC decides to sell city-owned land, what is the basis for that? Uh, who does the appraisal of the land? And if you could refer particularly to the pricing for the land at Gateway, which somehow dropped drastically uh, from what it had initially been appraised at. Mm -hmm. So who does the appraisal? Who impacts that appraisal? How independent are they of the developer mm -hmm. that's coming in? And of course, would let, love to get it at a lower rate. Mm -hmm. How is that done? Sure, uh, just absolutely. So just to talk specifically for a moment about the Albi, and then I'll talk about the other project you mentioned, Gateway. Um, right. So, so in the, again, in the case of the, the, the Albi Square project, um, that was an, an air right sale. It was a 100% commercial project. It was a ULERP, and we were also able to deliver a school as a part of it. Um, so it's a, a you know, from, from our perspective, it was a great outcome, and we worked in partnership with the council member through that. Uh, the we always do a third party appraisal as a part of our um, disposition, but um, before that, and I think, frankly, more importantly, we do a competitive procurement process um, where developers respond um, and we we then have an opportunity to negotiate with them and we negotiate for the highest possible price and also the most community benefits so that's our objective in many cases when we're asking you know we're in partnership with the elected officials we want that we want particular things we want a community center we want a school we want other important community elements and so that can reduce the price but you know if that's if that's in the interest of the community and the city, then that's often an investment we're collectively willing to make. So what type of uh, vetting goes on to assure that there's not a conflict of interest with the third party appraiser that you get? Because my understanding is that the same person that was used uh, for the gateway mm -hmm. final appraisal was in fact uh, employed by the developer. And I might think that would be a kind of conflict of interest. Um, we, we always, uh, we always. Um, so there, there are a certain number of appraisal firms in the city uh, that are high quality appraisal firms. Like CBRE is one of them, one of the well best known commercial brokerages um, in the world. They're an ex excellent appraisal firm. Uh, they certainly get used by real estate companies. They also get used by the city. Uh, they have a. a an ethical duty and they're ob obliged to provide an independent appraisal each and every time, even if they've worked for a developer in the past. EDC is a regular client of appraisers. You know, we don't believe that we have the ability to, you know, influence to them to do things that they're not comfortable with. And I believe the appraisers we work with, work with are ethical. But again, I really believe the more important thing is the fact that we're competitively negotiating these um, than it is necessarily the appraisal that's determining the price. Thank you. And finally, in terms of the, Mr. Chair, if I may, in, in terms of the uh, preliminary 10-year capital strategy, there's a category for waterfront development. Mm -hmm. And the governor has indicated that he wants to develop the waterfront between Pennsylvania and Fountain Avenue in East New York section. He wants to uh, put a park in there, he's gonna call it the Shirley Chisholm Park, and it is on the waterfront. I believe the application requires the city to give certain types of approvals for that park to go forward. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's gonna be trails and hiking and there will be a kayak uh, port, a kayak station there where people should be able to take kayaks. What type of involvement will the city have 
as this plan goes forward, knowing that this is still uh, a state project mm -hmm. and it's on that Jamaica Bay as well. But what kind of involvement can we expect the city will have in the development of this park? Yeah, so I'm not familiar with that particular project. Okay. Um, and it's unlikely that EDC would have particular involvement, but uh, you know, certainly city parks department, possibly the Par Department of Transportation, the Department of Environmental Protection, you know, all could have a role in that. Um, and we'd be happy to try to facilitate a conversation. Sounds like you, this is a project you're potentially supportive of to ensure that it moves forward as quickly as possible. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Uh, what I'd like to, if we could, uh, Mr. President, if we can go back to how we broke down the capital, the budget, and the explanation of it. There, sure. Actually, when you look at each one of the categories that you and I tackle, every one of these can be a hearing. <laughs> For the next 10 months, there is so much information in there. And when we break down the preliminary 10-year capital strategy, it goes from neighborhood revitalization to industrial development, waterfront development, commercial development, market development, community development, port development, fiscal 2020 preliminary capital budget. Um, but we won't tackle each one of those, but what I'd like to maybe just clear up, there's a section there called miscellaneous, where the preliminary 10-year capital strategy includes 785.6 million to miscellaneous funding. That's not a small number. So if you could help clarify what that category is and how it's determined. Um, okay. I don't know. Do you, it's, it's, oh, okay, okay. Okay, okay. And also the funding here? Are you sure? Okay, okay. So I, I don't have the document in front of me that you have in front of you, so let me um, try to do that. Um, so. It includes a couple of things, that I, to the best of my knowledge. Um, one is the Neighborhood Development Fund. Um, that is a, a set of funding that was set aside um, at the outset of this administration in partnership with the council to ensure that there were resources available for infrastructure investments um, as we went forward with individual rezoning actions. Um, so that's existing? So there would be an extra capital set aside for existing projects or ones that have yet to be uh, started? Uh, okay. Okay, all right, sorry. Um, yeah, those, are, those are, it's a combination. It is, combination. it's funding that has been identified through the EULA process for specific projects in partnership with the council members in those districts. And then there is additional funding remaining. You know, we're currently undergoing a rezoning effort in Bay Street in Manhattan. And so we would dedicate funding from that fund for that as well. And there are other areas of the city that we're in conversation with different council members about. And that, that funding would also be used for that. Um, I believe it also includes, oh, oh sorry, it also includes um, uh, funding for, uh, for uh, Trust for Governors Island, which is not an EDC. There's, you know, so it's not an EDC agency, it's a separate organization. Just to make sure you're aware, our budget includes um, money for both uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Trust for Governors Island, and they may appear um, all together, but they're, we have no, uh, they're, they're all in the economic development budget, but we don't have any authority over them. They don't actually run through EDC's budget in any way. Is that reflected in, in this pot of money, or is that a separate? Yes, the Governor's Island money, as I understand it, is also in that, fun, in that pot of money that you're referring to. Um, uh, so so th those are some of the funds that are available there. I'm happy to provide you with more detail. So maybe we can break that down then Yeah, we can. Forward. Those are the categories that OMB categorizes our capital projects in. We can definitely get you a breakdown of what falls into that miscellaneous category. Much appreciated, because it's a large number. Absolutely. So just uh, when you see numbers like that, I, I want to make sure we can flush and compare it year to year as to where it's going and how we can categorize mm -hmm. it from agency to community so we can reflect. Um, and the last thing I'd, I'd like to talk about, since, since we are talking about generating projects and whether generating revenue and the different type of approaches that EDC will take, um, sometimes they don't work and sometimes we don't make money on a project or there'll be some, something that happened that we're, we're not getting what we expected and that's never what we want, but sometimes it happens. So one of the projects I guess we could use is like the BioBat Technology Center where we 
um, it voted to take back 60% of the floor space and a program to attack biotech companies. Maybe you could just use that as an example of maybe what type of provisions EDC has in its in its toolbox as a clawback or protection if if a project doesn't meet its goals. Right. Um, so I think that was a that was a vision from some time ago. Um, the the for to develop biotech space uh, at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Um, that was in an area of the Brooklyn Army Terminal that we refer to as phase six, um, which is the last phase of the Brooklyn Army Terminal, the furthest, uh, the, 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 the phase that's had the least infrastructure investment in it. Uh, we have comprehensively, over time, done full re, uh, re um, refurbishments of each of the first five phases of the development. Uh, the reality is these spaces are set aside for in industrial companies. Um, they don't have the resources to fit out the space from what it's in, with the shape it's in, which is completely dilapidated, unready to be occupied. So what we have done is allocated city capital, renovated the space, and turned around and, re and rented them to companies. Um, that space, though we took back some of the space, never had funding associated with it to actually do the necessary infrastructure work to bring companies in. Um, you know, we, we believe that this is a good opportunity now that EDC has full control of it back, that 60% that of space. Um, we believe we could create close to 600 jobs in that space um, with a little over $60 million in funding from the city. So we're gonna be seeking that funding now that we have control of the space. Uh, we actually view it as an opportunity to further expand the success of the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Well, that's, that's a, I guess, an example of how we can reuse and reshape yes. and go forward. So are there other tools or is there anything else the council can do to help enhance those protections um, going forward in the contractual obligations that we, we go forward with in ways that we can provide some type of level of guarantee of success, and if that's not met, that we are mm -hmm. able to reshape that project, go back, have whether it's penalties, provisions, support, however we can tackle that project to relook at it. So, anything else we can do with EDC on that? You no, know, I think we should continue to discuss it. Um, you know, we always have uh, w ways we can do things better. You know, we we take com we take compliance very seriously. We tend to have extremely rigorous contracts that require people to meet performance milestones over time, um, and we have the th ultimate ability to to revert back the uh, um, the revert back those properties if they're unsuccessful. You know, over 96% of our properties are compliant and succeeding. That means we have you know a little over 3% that are that are not successful. Uh, in those cases, we're prepared to take back the property if we have to, levy financial penalties if we have to. Uh, that's what we do, because um, you know it's the city's property and it's our obligation to ensure that we're getting the public benefit out of it that the city deserves. Now with that, I'd like to say we've had one heck of a year together. Um, yeah. I'm very proud to chair this committee and I know that we have tackled probably more than just about the history of, of EDC prior of what's happened in this last year. So I thank you and your team that's around you to make this day happen. And for me, I'm surrounded by, uh, I didn't sound this good without having the support yeah. of the crew that's next to me. So uh, thank you to Alex Polinoff and happy birthday, by the way. Um, Aaliyah, Kira, <laughs> I know Emily just stepped out. Uh, and in my staff, I have Jonathan, Michael, my white staff and Ahmed, my deputy chief. So while you're still here, I wanted to acknowledge yeah. them because uh, these committee hearings, all the hard work they do behind the scenes to prepare for these tremendous volume that's in these here. I mean, this, this hearing alone, uh, yesterday we did the veterans budget at $5.7 million. Mm -hmm. And then the first category in here, uh, you know, sometimes it's night and day. So I just wanted to thank uh, you and the staff for that. And thank you. Well, thank you to you and your team. And I have to say thank you to my team for all the tremendous amount of work that also went into working with you on this and preparing for this hearing. So thank you all. All right, so we'll start with our first panel. We'll give some time for James and his crew. So once they're able to, uh, to take that, we're gonna call up Marisol Linda Diaz from Brooklyn Stone and Tile, Sadouf Sayal uh, from NYC Now, Julian Hill, the Urban Justice Center, Eileen Fuchs from Snug Harbor Cultural Center, welcome back, and that was it. So we have Marisol, Sadouf, Julian, and Eileen will be our first panel. 
if you have testimony, just give it to our crack security. Thank you. If not, we're going to have this room is in use not too long from now, so we can't go too much longer. Well, we're still in good morning, so good morning, everyone. Why don't we start from left to right and go? Whoever would like to start, I'll leave it up to you. Just make sure your mic is on. I don't know if the red light, is the red light on in front of you? Just push that button. It's my first rodeo. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can break the ice for me, please. Thank you. I'm going to break the ice. <laughs> Perfect, so, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Chairperson Malone and, and members of the City Council Committee of, uh, on Economic Development. My name is Sadaf Sial. I am the coordinating director at the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives. We are a local trade association of worker cooperative businesses across the five boroughs of New York City um, in a variety of different industries. I'm also here today on behalf of 14 nonprofit organizations that make up the worker cooperative uh, business Development Initiative, WCBDI, um, and that I always is wanted to have a hearing with you on that. I think we're going to have to get that scheduled. There's so much going on there. That that would be excellent and great. Um, but we're, I'm here to talk a little bit, share a little bit now, and and would love for the opportunity to discuss even more. It is an exciting initiative that works to create, sustain, and grow worker cooperative businesses across the city. And these are businesses that are owned and controlled by overwhelming majority people of color, immigrants, and women of color in this city. And so uh, we want to urge the city council to continue its support of worker cooperatives that create dignified jobs with living wages for communities uh, and workers across the city. And uh, by enhancing the initiative of WCBDI from 3.6 million this past fiscal year to 4.85 in FY20. Um, I just want to say that in, when the city council decided to support WCBDI that first year in, in fiscal year 15, it was the first city in the country to support the development of worker cooperatives. And since then, it has inspired other cities around the nation to do the same, from Madison, Wisconsin, to just a few weeks ago in Berkeley, California. And so we hope that the city continues to provide leadership in this area and support worker-owned businesses as a, as a model for economic development and job creation and job retention. Um, I also want to say on a federal level, we saw also this past year the first support for worker cooperatives um, through the passage of the Main Street Employee Ownership Act. And so uh, we're seeing a recognition both nationally and locally that's growing and an interest across communities. Clearly it was all us that started. <laughs> so it's, it's Great. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know how much I should explain about worker co-ops, um, not to go too much into it, but to say that it is a model that allows for workers to come together and pool their resources and form democratically owned businesses where they make decisions about their wages, their working conditions. So with the little time, what would you like to see the next step? As the next step, we would, we would love to request that the city continue to support worker cooperative businesses and, and WCBDI. We are seeking enhancement in FY20 to 4.85 million. And uh, in addition, I think that beyond WCBDI, there's a lot, much, much more that the city can do to support worker co-ops. Worker co-ops have needs well beyond um, the education and technical assistance that happens under WCBDI, but there's a need for space, for um, procurement, um, for and contracting with worker co-ops, um, access to the MWBE certification. We have a whole list of issues working with worker co-ops that we've identified, and actually this past year we had um, this last year, I believe we were able to sit down with Mr. Patchett uh, and NYC EDC to talk about worker cooperatives. We'd love to see a follow-up or a continuation to that conversation because we also think perhaps the EDC, there's resources there that can support Done. worker cooperative Done. growth. We'll make that happen because every time Amazing. you come and every time you testify, we always look to each other and say we need to expand, enhance, and promote. So uh, whether scheduling a hearing to talk about it and having James's team Wonderful. This, this is exactly what everyone needs, every city needs, and will help, and, and you're already doing so. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. 
No, I'm always, I, we learn when you come, so we always appreciate that you stay for the whole hearing, hang in there. There's like 13 council members on this particular hearing, and each one speaks in the testimony. You see the size of EDC's budget, so we have to tackle, and we appreciate that you stay. Uh, we thank you for that. So, yeah. Well, it's definitely a new platform for me. Uh, last time I was, I think, in the building was for uh, Menudo boy group band that I was coming to see when my mother worked for the mayor's office. <laughs> uh, so this is a completely different a platform. Different. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm here and proud to uh, give a testimony to the accomplishment that Broken Stone and Tile, um, which is an employee worker, uh, owned uh, business in Broken Navy Yard. Sorry, I'll get the nerves out in about 30 seconds. You're doing fine. Um, <laughs> um, we came from back in 2017, we found ourselves with the previous company. Uh, baby boomer, boomer decided to retire, and we found ourselves 20 employees, all minor, about 80% of them were minorities, uh, representing 12 different countries. Um, I would say about 80% of them also were not of college background. They basically had a skilled uh, trade that they, they were able to fulfill with 20 to 25 years of experience. Um, we, through, uh, the part, through the connection that the baby boomer had made with uh, the work, a nonprofit organization called The Working World, uh, they tried to convert the business to the workers at that time. For legal reasons, that didn't happen. Um, but through the due diligence process, spending the time with the, the working world, they realized that they, they had skill set, they had workers that had passion, drive, uh, and we're committed to continue in this business, given the chance. Um, they sat me down January 2018, and uh, basically I felt like I hit lotto, because uh, they sat me down and said, we have funding, um, and we believe in your team, and we believe that you're, you can be successful. Uh, it was music to my ears, because I always had the passion and the drive for it, uh, for my employees, to give them a better working environment, uh, to give them better benefits, but to do something for, for our own, uh, something that we could stand for. Uh, not a dollar came out of my pocket. I didn't have to give up my firstborn, which allowed um, an empowerment for, for us to truly take ownership of what we were doing. We knew what we had to do. It was just a matter of being given the opportunity to give a platform to, to go ahead and, and, and do that. Um, so as aggressive as I was to save as many jobs as possible, um, we, Brooklyn Stone and Tile was born in April 2018. So from January to April, we came up with a business model. We had several meetings. Uh, it was three of us driving this, this force uh, to try to make it happen as quick as possible so that we wouldn't have too many employees uh, unemployed for a long period of time. I'm proud to say that we have nine on board at this moment um, with seven more that call me constantly. Uh, are you ready for me? Um, so to be able to provide that culture and give back to the employees and, and give them a platform to do that, to set up a, a retirement fund, which is something that they didn't have in the previous company, um, to be able to do something like that and work towards something like that uh, makes us proud every day. We love coming to work. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to do that without the financial support that we received from the working world, along with technical support, because they gave me tools to, in the areas that I was not strong at, which is financial management and the tools I needed to do that um, to make so sure. So what would you like to see as the next step? I would love to see an awareness and, and, and I didn't even know this existed prior to 2017, the fact that there was a cooperative where, you know, uh, we could potentially become owners um, and, and have the funding to do so, but an awareness for the resources that come along through, that I've been able to capture through the small business services, uh, through other organizations that support. I agree, I think that's the future of small uh, business, the cost of doing. Absolutely, there's a lot, I can mention a dozen of businesses in my own industry that have baby boomers and the children <laughs> don't want to take over the business. So what happens to the employees? You know, they're, they're out and a lot of them have to go back to their country uh, because there's no oh. jobs here. With that said, it, small business is the backbone of almost any city, Absolutely. and I don't think we've done enough on this front. If you look at, like you said, either finding out the information on your own, the financial opportunities that exist, whether it's WMBEs or just new businesses or the existing businesses Absolutely. that are trying to stay alive for the next generation or just grow into the 21st century model, it's a whole new world. I mean, just look at the kids coming out from high school and college. They're not doing what exactly. we did. So it's, it's, that's why it's so important we hear from you. So we'll continue on. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next?
I, I can go next. I'm Chairman Vallone, members of the Committee on Economic Development. Thanks for this opportunity to testify on the social, political, and moral benefits that cooperatives provide to their worker owners and their larger community, as well as the critical nature of legal services and technical assistance funded by WCBDI uh, for creating New York City, a New York City that centers equity, increases a sense of belonging, and encourages democratically run enterprises. My name is Julian Hill, and I'm a staff attorney at the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center. Among other things, CDP strengthens the impact of grassroots organizations in New York City's low-income and other marginalized communities by providing legal support. We bring cases, we publish community-driven research reports, and we provide meaningful technical assistance in support of racial, economic, and social justice. For almost 15 years, CDP has collaborated with community organizations to help low-income New York City residents form worker-owned cooperative businesses. I love my job leaving a lucrative Wall Street law firm job to do it, and WCBDI makes it possible for me to be here today. I enjoy demystifying very complicated legal concepts so that my mostly brilliant, mostly black, mostly brown, mostly women, often immigrant worker owner clients can do what they do best, and they trust me to ensure that the legal structures reflect their values of cooperation. I'm just gonna mention two quick examples, Woke Foods, a woman-owned Dominican and Afro-Caribbean food service cooperative that we've been working with over the past few years with respect to corporate structure, including their actual formation, um, as well as ongoing questions they've had around employment and the like. Also, Jaime Madre, a woman of color-owned cooperative that's relatively new um, in the legal cannabis-based oil space. Um, that's empowering women, some of whom may be sisters, cousins, daughters, and friends of folks who've been incarcerated in this and other cities' jails and prisons as a result of the war on drugs, empowering them to be at the forefront of a burgeoning industry, but also doing so in a way that honors their labor and thinks through how to advocate for space and voices for the most marginalized. Whether we're talking about language justice, access to birth doulas, accessible housing for young mothers, or any number of issues affecting among New York's historically most marginalized communities, many of our clients are tackling difficult social issues difficult political issues, while at the same time strengthening New York City's communities and improving the lives and incomes of community members. This year, CDP, this year, has already taken on over 15 new worker cooperative clients, partnering with several cooperative incubators and developers, including the Center for Family Life, Green Worker Cooperatives, and the ICA Group. And I'll note that we're actually working on our first um, conversion this year, which is uh, like the project that was mentioned before. But as this ecosystem grows, so too does the need for legal support and technical assistance. Um, just, to, just to finish, um, I've seen my cooperative clients uh, base since the last year has increased. I'm, I, have about, I have over 20 worker cooperative clients right now, each with at least a few distinct matters. And as one of primarily two organizations providing free legal services to worker cooperatives and understanding that private law firm attorneys are billed out at hundreds of dollars an hour, we understand how expensive and hard it can be to find other options for legal services that are able to provide such niche worker cooperative expertise. So with that, we respectfully request that the council continue to support us and increase the funding that we have for WCBDI to 4.85 million. Happy to answer any other questions around legal services or technical assistance. Well, Julian, thank you for making that decision to leave Wall Street and take on these great clients as a lawyer myself, almost 30 years. The, the greatest work is the work you can do to help those who really truly need the work and the help. Um, this is perfect timing when you present the testimony and talk about enhancing of initiatives and budgetary items, that's why we're here. So when you give this in this format, we thank you because this goes directly to staff, to the speaker who then fights and advocates on behalf of the council members and then projects like each one of yours who then in the executive budget comes out that's where the changes are made. So I just want to let you know how important, this is never a waste of time. This, this information really does drive the battles that goes on both sides of the house. Uh, and these stories are so critical for us to understand that. Um, my question for you, Julian, would be what, what legal services do, are not being provided that you could see that could be invited, invite, included if the initiative was enhanced? So we also are doing some work around- Or maybe done more extensively what's already being done. Yeah, so we are also a member of the CLA program, and so we're also one of the legal services providing support for commercial leases, and so I think 
as Sadaf mentioned before, um, helping to provide support around space. Um, it's, a, it's an issue that comes up commonly with my worker cooperative um, clients. I think also helping them negotiate financing is also a key area where there isn't a lot of legal support. And I think also uh, with respect to um, handling disputes, uh, we are an organization that only does transactional work for worker cooperatives. And so to the extent that there is support and with respect to funding to help them with, uh, with conflict resolution with clients, et cetera, I think that would, those would be three areas where. Well, I'll just conclude with, with that by saying I think the conversation with EDC and, and providing that financial arm and assistance and the toolbox that they have is something we need to explore. Because even with this initiative, it's really small amount of money. It's true. Their budget, what we just heard, is completely different from what we're dealing with. And so much is dependent on the council initiative funding, which shouldn't be. So when we can get those things baseline, then you'll know you have that money. So thank you. And your turn. <clears throat> thank you. Um, switching gears to culture here. Good afternoon, Chair Vallone and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Eileen Fuchs, and I am the President and CEO of Snug Harbor Cultural Center and Botanical Welcome Garden. Back. Thank you. Uh, located on the North Shore of Staten Island, Snug Harbor is a proud member of the CIGs, a coalition of 33 cultural organizations that share a public-private partnership with the City of New York and are located in all five boroughs. Um, as the head of Snug Harbor and on behalf of the CIGs, I'm here today to provide testimony on the profound economic impact of cultural institutions in New York City, and we are so grateful for your support and the continued support of the mayor and the whole council. Um, Snug Harbor is both a cultural programmer and a property manager of an 83-acre historic site that also houses two other CIGs and multiple other organizations. In FY18, Snug Harbor and our constituents hosted over 400,000 visitors. Our education department serves 22,000 students last year, 16,000 of them from low-income communities in Title I schools. Our partnership with the New York City Pro Department of Probation provides workforce development opportunities to young adults seeking to rebuild their lives. Partnerships with CUNY, AmeriCorps, and, other pro and others provide internships, internships for summer youth employment opportunities for youth in our communities. And our Heritage Farm gives 10% of its annual yield to food insecure New Yorkers while simultaneously sourcing to some of the city's best restaurants. Snug Harbor is the cultural anchor of our borough. It is where Staten Islanders experience their first museum or take in their first live performance. It is where they take in classes in visual arts, dance, music, theater, horticulture, yoga. It is where they walk their dogs, take their prom photos, and it's where they get married. The arts and culture sector contributes hundreds of billions of dollars annually to the American economy. We know that the impact of the cultural sector on New York City is considerable. CIGs in each borough drive tourism and economic investment. CIGs are job creators. In 2017, CIGs employed 15,700 full and part-time employees, including 5,800 union members, and spent upwards of $490 million on local vendors. In FY18 at Snug Harbor, we spent nearly $2 million on vendors. Fully two-thirds of our vendors are located in New York City. Collectively, Snug Harbor and our constituent organizations are the largest cultural employers in Richmond County. Uh, we, are the key, we are key economic drivers for the North Shore of Staten Island, a state-designated economic opportunity zone with a poverty level of 23.7%. Snug Harbor raised the bar this past year by hosting the first ever New York City Winter Lantern Festival, which put our borough on the map as a desirable holiday and tourist destination. More than 150,000 visitors attended this six-week festival, which became a topped photograph location during the holiday season with over 7 million social media impressions. These visitors ate in local restaurants, they drank in local bars, they got gas at local gas stations and discovered the new, unique character of our communities. With continued and increased city support, Snug Harbor can host this and more cultural events and attract new audiences to a borough that has been traditionally cut out of the tourism conversation. So I, I was really appreciative of um, Mr. Pratchett's earlier comments about spreading that tourism to other boroughs. Um, so the CIG has asked the City Council to increase funding in FY20 to the Department of Cultural Affairs, and while not the purview of this committee, we ask your consideration of these budget requests in the budget process. As we have seen, the economic impact of our city's cultural organization is substantial. Thank you. I, mean, I just want to thank you for that, plus the combo with the educational work and the students, just things you may not even be aware of. So when I was able to bring my very first middle school to College Point, a waterfront community, Testimonies like yours, working with the Harbor School in Manhattan, Absolutely. working with the Billion Oyster Project, yep. is now exists in that school because of these type of testimonies stayed with me. I brought it to that principal. She had no idea. Kids love it. The parents are through the roof. It's a small school, but it was created through these meetings. That's right. So just you know, the good seeds that continue. And we have to just do that. For me, the whole point is how do we get this to the students so that they can embody it 
learn from it. The jobs that are there that's for right, them That's right, that's the pipeline. We are contributing to that pipeline. Tremendous amount of jobs in these fields for them that are waiting. Um, so that. So with this panel, I say thank you, and we'll look forward to working with each one of you. Our next panel, we have, and again, uh, oh, Councilmember Carnegie, you came up, my friend. I'm sorry. Did you want to maybe ask a question of this panel before they go? No, thank You're good. All right, thank you. And Councilmember Richard snuck in. The two of you on my left now. See? No, sorry, you're not allowed. Only, only, <laughs> only Carnegie's allowed to ask. A <laughs> Would you like to ask a question, Donovan, before they go? No? All right. And so the next crew is coming up is Eve, Eva Morose Ortega, Katie Parks, Ann Bilger. I think that's Bilger. Uh, work, is, work is Justice Project. That's the three. Is that our last three? Or is that another panel? Three more. Yeah, maybe we can. I think I'm seeing two. So maybe we can combine. Um, the last three I have is Tasfia Rahman, Eric Kim, and Carolyn Cohen. Are they here? Maybe we'll. Get everybody up. Is that okay? So good, we'll ask you all the questions then. <laughs> if you're filling in, no problem. <laughs> all right, why don't we start with who we have? Make sure your mic's on, sorry. Do this. Is it on? Yes. <laughs> um, good morning, um, Chairman Ballone. I think we're officially um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, my name is Eve Moros Ortega. I am a National Urban um, Fellow at CUNY, uh, a trustee of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, and uh, board president for Arts Gowanus. And I want to first thank you all for this opportunity to speak about arts and culture. It was great to um, follow what Snug Harbor just said. Um, uh, because I think I agree that this is really a necessity for our economic development. It is not a luxury. Um, and there's a lot of data to support that. That is in my printed remarks uh, just last week. The U.S. government data was released by the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the National Endowment for the Arts, which showed that arts generated 4.2% of the overall U.S. GDP, employing roughly 4.9 million Americans who collectively earned over $370 billion. And in New York City, our Create NYC Cultural Plan City uh, cites studies showing the creative and cultural sectors in New York City provide over 400,000 jobs, and that the nonprofit cultural sector alone has generated over $8 billion in a year. Um, I fully agree with Snug Harbor's comments about the importance of our marquee institutions, our CIG groups, and the other large um, drivers of tourism, to your point, um, Council Member Powers. Uh, but I also want to speak to the importance of supporting the many smaller organizations, uh, in, such as Arts Gowanus. And I, as a Gowanus resident, I can really speak to those. Uh, Gowanus is, Arts Gowanus' mission is to support a thriving cultural community for the rapidly changing and very diverse neighborhood of Gowanus, Brooklyn. We have um, Nitro, everything from NYCHA residents to one of the largest populations of artists in the whole city. It is a very important driver for tourism actually in Gowanus, and I've seen that personally in the five years that I have um, been on the board of Arts Gowanus, and there's been a real change, and I, wanna, I know that um, Council Member Lander had to leave, but I want to thank him and Council Member Levin specifically because their discretionary funds have been crucial to really allowing Arts Gowanus to um, survive. We'll make sure you know they know that. Yeah, that's, uh, so, and, and what I want to speak to is the impact of that funding. So, in these five years, our budget grew fourfold, which, you know, it's a small organization. It's, a hun it's like about $100,000 a year right now. Um, but it is having a massive multiplier effect in the neighborhood, and you can just see that on the ground. If you come to the Gowanus Open Studios, you'll see just the thousands of people who fill the neighborhood during that weekend. And we've seen at Arts Gowanus, you know, it used to be it was really hard to get small businesses, to your point about small businesses being motor, the motor of the city. When we were initially trying to get those small businesses to advertise with us, it was a real struggle. You know, they, $100 for an ad is a lot for them. And now they call us and they want to, you know, can we get our $325 ad? Can we be a sponsor for a few thousand dollars? Because they see the impact that we bring to them, just like 
Snug Harbor was saying, you know, that people are eating in their restaurants, buying in their shops, looking for accommodations in their hotels. I would also say that they are, you know, more inclined to want to live in that neighborhood and purchase or rent real estate as a result. So it's a, you know, it's a really, really vital part of our economy, um, and I just can't stress that enough. Um, well, I thanks. also want to we say- We have your testimony, oh, so that's sorry. a good thing. Uh, so yeah, there are thousands of others who would probably want to be here today if they weren't so busy just doing that work, uh, and I just urge you to continue to support the, and increase the funding for arts and culture in the city. Thank you so much. Probably of all the groups, they're the ones who can't take the day off and come today, so we, we yes. get that. Thank you. Testing. Good? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Great. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Katie Parks, and I am here on behalf of the Business Outreach Center Network and our affiliate Small Business Loan Funds, Bach Capital Core CDFI. Bach Network is a partner with New York City to advance equitable economic development strategies. Our focus on business technical assistance, customized small business training, and access to capital is designed to advance entrepreneurship in largely immigrant and minority communities throughout New York City. We serve two industrial business areas and operate the first business incubator in the Bronx. Bach Network is a member of the New York City Worker Cooperative Coalition, providing practical business development assistance to the growing number of cooperative businesses. Bach leads equity-driven initiatives and delivers affordable capital to minority and women-owned businesses. Bach Capital has loaned over $25 million to date. We deliver New York City's Contract Finance Loan Fund, which has leveraged over $24 million in contracts for small businesses since March 2017, with close to $6 million in New York City contract financing loans. We see the impact of the mayor's MWBE strategies that focus on MWBE participation combined with capital and TA required to succeed. Bach is working to grow an ecosystem of support for small and minority owned businesses. We operate the first business incubator in the Bronx where we run programs that promote quality jobs through small business development and cooperative business ownership. As a result, Bach Network is supporting highly impactful business assistance programs that benefit minority and women-owned businesses and promote new and innovative solutions, including the Contract Finance Loan Fund. The role of city agencies in aligning their practices with the Contract Finance Loan Fund cannot be overstated. Agencies that are reluctant to accommodate lending to MWBEs with contracts are creating barriers to their success. All agencies should be required to adopt best practices that enable MWBEs to utilize this unique capital resource that New York City has created. Also, the Construct NYC program of New York City EDC provides an innovative model for creating a path to new opportunities for MWBEs. Bach Capital is privileged to partner with New York City EDC to deliver capacity building training TA to, and TA to contractors that are pre-qualified for new contracts. The Bach Network and its members serving all five boroughs of New York City request the, the City Council to increase its investment in the Chamber on the Go and Small Business Initiative overall. We are requesting to increase the allocation to Bach from 113,000 to 190,000, which will increase our inclusive business development services and will also leverage federal dollars. And Bach joins the Worker Cooperative Coalition to request the City Council to add resources that will enable expansion of the initiative from 3.6 million to 4.8 million. As this initiative and ecosystem progresses, the worker cooperative movement promises to broaden throughout New York City through business ownership transitions and social venture models. New York City Council has played a strategic role in supporting initiatives to save and create jobs, to encourage neighborhood business development, and to support strategies for equitable local economies and both WBE access to contracts. We look forward to our continued work together towards these shared goals. Wow, perfect timing. Yeah, and, a wow. beautiful, <laughs> and a beautiful book that you have. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. There, perfect. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. Uh, I want to thank you, Chairman Malone, for, and the distinguished members of the New York Council uh, for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Aline Byler, and I'm here representing Workers' Justice Project. Uh, as an immigrant myself and staff member of Workers' Justice Project, I feel particularly honored uh, to speak on behalf of our, of our organization that has been for more than 10 years supporting the creation of stronger, equal, and a fair economy for our community by engaging immigrant communities and working with day laborers in all five boroughs. Uh, in Workers' Justice, we believe in fighting for the rights of immigrants to work in safe and protected environment where, all, where they're not deprived of their human rights nor excluded from laws and regulation made for all individuals alike. We believe that through organizing, education, and leadership development, 
uh, a change can be created in the relationship between workers and their employers, therefore sustaining an economy, an economy that grows and thrives with equality. Workers' Justice Project organizes state laborers who do not have traditional employment relations and work in unregulated, unregulated industries. Through its state labor center, WJP provides a way to fight, wait, fight wage, wage theft and health and safety violations, while also developing career pathways for construction workers by enab enabling them to obtain critical occupations and leadership skills through on-site training. For workers who, because of their immigration status, do not have a clear pathway and cannot access certain union trainings of New York City's workforce service, the Day Labor Center is a hub that provides training to build necessary skills. We appreciate the New York City Council's support to the Day Labor Workforce Initiative in FY19, which has allowed WJP to connect day laborers to our opportunities for continued training and skill building. At the WJP Day Labor Center, workers collectively set the wage floor at $20 per hour, but wage, wages can all, also go up to even $28 an hour. Through our center, WJP is building partnership with build businesses and contractors who want to be responsible employers by one, hiring from within the community, two, sign, signing an agreement to pay the center's minimum wage, three, providing health and safety equipment, and four, allowing the center access to uh, the job site for inspection if necessary. Also, employers are agreeing to an eight-hour workday and with a 30-minute break for lunch and provide water for workers. The center makes itself appealing to the responsible employers by connecting them with a skilled and trained workforce that is often neglected from New York City traditional workforce development services. Because employers know and trust that workers can provide a skilled labor and have been trained and assessed, they are willing to pay the higher wages. The center also plays a role in revitalizing the local economy, creating about a million dollars in revenue every year through increased wages. Through uh, the day labor center, workers have been able to increase their salaries by 30 to 40 percent. We're proud to be building a city that values the contribution, the contribution of day labor community, but most importantly, that is investing in a meaningful workforce development infrastructure through the day labor workforce initiative. New York City, <coughs> excuse me. New York City has been a model for other cities to follow. We hope that you will continue to make a commitment to, to lead the nation in the fight for workers' rights and workforce development inclusion. Again, thank you for your support in FY19, and we urge the Council to support the expansion and development of these two key initiatives. First, the Day Labor Workforce Initiative with funding of $3.6 million, and second, the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative with funding $4.8 million in FY2020. It is through your enhanced support that we can work on the development of new and creative opportunities for immigrants in the economy of our city. We will continue to expand our services and reach to provide more construction safety and skill building trainings, immigration, and know your right to wage theft. Wage theft case management, educational services, and technical assistance services to developing cooperatives and referral to legal institutions. We're poised to take major steps in addressing the needs of our worker and immigrant community in FY20, and we need the continued support of the city to council to make this plan. Again, thank you, and thank we you. will always continue to advocate to either keep the initiative or enhance the initiative, so thank you. We appreciate and it. And our last testifier today will be? Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Tasfia Rahman, and Welcome. I am, thank you. I am a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. Um, thank you, Chair and Committee Council, for giving me the opportunity to testify. Um, since 1986, CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support those in need. Um, CACF also leads the 15% and Growing Campaign, a group of over 45 Asian-led and serving organizations that work together to ensure that New York City's budget protects the most vulnerable Asian Pacific American New Yorkers. So. Um, the reason we're testifying here today, and I'm combining my testimony with uh, Carlin's at the Chinese Planning, Ameri Chinese, uh, Planning American Council, um, we are asking for oversight and increase in funding um, for immigrant-specific uh, workforce development, um, namely uh, uh, back in 2014, the administration had promised to invest $60 million in annual funding in um, career pathways, um, which is bridge, pro uh, bridge programming for um, uh, low-skilled uh, low workers and helping them build the skills that they need to enter the workforce. Well, they should, since it went from 13% to 14% to 15%. Yep. I mean, uh, you gotta increase as the numbers keep going higher. Right, um, but 
but I do want to highlight that immigrants do comprise 47% of the workforce, and they do face unique challenges that aren't often traditionally highlighted. Um, for example, uh, the current bridge programming, one we, the funding has been delivered in, piece, in a piecemeal tradition, and it hasn't been consistent. Um, and also, it's, it's not only insufficient, but it's also inaccessible to most immigrant job seekers with limited or no English proficiency who do not meet the requirements for intermediate or advanced proficiency in English. So we spe especially urge that the, a significant portion of that funding were to appear um, to be used to fund an innovative pilot immigrant workforce development initiative with a focus on integrating pre-literacy and basic ESL classes with vocational ESL classes, digital literacy, um, skills training, and student support services. And the second um, request is also um, more investment in protecting, uh, giving legal protection to immigrants. So this is, I'm thinking from CPC's testimony, um, uh, the city must invest in language accessible legal services through the community-based organizations that have deep contact with immigrants. Employment, housing, and immigration, as you all know, are the top three legal issues facing immigrant New Yorkers. They are deeply interconnected. Often, employers will exploit their workers because of immigration status, for example, and immigrant workers are unfamiliar with the system and do not even know that they have a potential legal case until a CBO staff member um, identifies an issue. Um, so. Yet despite this high need, there's not a single APAI legal service provider in New York City, and there are no funding streams for CBOs to provide you know, your rights, consultation, case, and take, et cetera. So um, we at 15%, which makes up CP, uh, in terms of the organizations that um, have been helping us develop this workforce, um, request uh, Asian Americans for Equality, CMP, as well as CPC, uh, we look forward to ask, answering any questions and working with you to move this initiative forward. Well, thank you to the last panel for staying for the whole day. Thank you to everyone who testified. Uh, the vision of EDC is formed through this testimony, so we thank you very much. And with that, I thank my fellow council members for hanging in there for today, and the staff, as we thank, our hearing is concluded.